Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock, which means it's time for Eight Talk Magic. And today I am here with a man that needs no introduction because he has been uh, in the magic community around the whole of the world for a very long time. He has done it all, been there, done that. He is responsible for some incredible products. He's a creator, an inventor, a performer, an innovator, and also a bloody nice guy. I'm talking about the one and only Mr. Wayne Goodman. How are you, man? Hello. Yeah, nice to see you. Thanks hey. for having me on. Hey, I am excited that you are here on the channel. And by the way, I'd like to give you the official Magic TV Award for the person with the best wallpaper on an interview. So, so this, is, this is actually the same as your background. And these are stickers that I stuck on. Nice. So there's not actually wallpaper. I, well, me and my daughter made these. We started off with uh, just some blue ones and it looks a bit bare still. So I would learn more. And um, yeah, these are, some of them are peeled off and stuff. But yeah, it's not wallpaper. That is actually actually stuck on. And I've got some magic. I don't know if you can see them, but I've got some magic pictures. Yeah. And my chair has just broken. So <laughs> my chair, I cannot believe my chair just literally gave way on me uh because because i went forward that's why um but yeah i've got some magic pictures above me and uh, you know, it's going down here, i'm going to stand up for this i'm going to be stood up for the interview now i don't know what happened there uh but yeah i've got some I magic think, uh, i would edit this out for anyone else but for you i'm keeping this in I'm, i don't I'm know what's happening it's just all the air i might have to convert that into <laughs> one of those spike chairs uh yeah i've got some magic pictures behind me as well these are my my magic wall i've got my ego wall up there which is posters of me and uh, this is a show I did in Spain and look sharp and then one of my favourite Houdini posters. So, right. yeah, <laughs> I can't believe that. I can't believe it. It's not going to... Unbelievable. In seriousness, are you sure you don't want to fix your chair and sit down? I, I don't. I, I, I think it's just going to keep doing it. it it's, a, it's, got, it's one of those air pressure ones, but I don't know why. But now, yeah, I think it's just going to... I think it's just going to collapse again. Oh, we might be all right. We might be all right. Let me, let, we'll give it a try. We'll give it a try. Tell you what, just don't move. And yeah, we'll, that's it. Don't be too animated. Just, I'm just going to stay really yeah, still now. Stay there. Like You're allowed to smile, but don't move and we'll be I'm, okay. I've got a cup of tea over here and I don't reach for don't it. Don't reach for it. Do not reach for the tea because if I see you going down, that's it. We're standing up for the rest of the interview. <laughs> I can't oh. believe that. That's just amazing. Anyway, uh, yes. that's got to be the most interesting start to a Magic TV interview I've ever done. But you know really? what, Wayne, thank you so much. I know that you've been very busy at the time of filming. We've just come out of uh, restrictions, world's yep. opening up, people are starting to do gigs again. Um, you've been remarkably busy through COVID. You've been one of the guys that have been spearheading the online stuff, the virtual stuff, the Facebook stuff. You've been you've been working hard while everyone else has been sitting around collecting their government money and crying into their soup. You've been there, kind of. Uh, and I, and I, I released three trick, uh, three books, and five tricks as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you've kept so, stuff busy. So I'm a firm believer that no matter what, how, I mean, we, ev everybody goes through trials and tribulations in your life. And, and nobody has it easy, you know, uh, anything could happen. It might be that, you know, right in the middle of the busiest season, your car breaks down and it's a real, okay, you just go and buy another car, but there's still, that's a aggro that you can do without. But I believe, you know, the last year and a half has been difficult for everybody. But I think my belief is if you keep moving, it doesn't matter which direction you move in, but just keep moving, you will do okay. You know, it's when you stop that, that, the bad things happen so you keep moving you know i used to work on the ships and uh, we were up in in norway i think it was and uh we were, uh, we were selling out of helsinki actually and uh, the water was frozen in, in the in the dock and they got the boat moving just slightly and then as it got faster and faster it started to break the ice more and more and we got out of the dock and uh, that's kind of like the metaphor that i use this is if the ship had stopped then the ice would have just frozen around it wouldn't have moved at all but as it started moving, it started breaking the ice and going further and further, and then it was able to get away. So I think, you know, if you stop, you become stagnant. But if you push forward and you keep going, or in any direction, then you keep going and things get better. That's really good analogy. Really good analogy. Now, I, I, want, to them. Talk, <laughs> I want to talk all about you. Now, a lot of people that are watching this are going to know you as... Uh, a creator, the guy that literally wrote the book on restaurant magic, um, you know, the 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 uh, the person who created Look no Look Sharp, which is one of the most popular 
trips for workers in the last decade and we want to talk about all of that some people might know you as the robin to peter nardi's batman i mean there's, <laughs> there's, you know people oh no like, oh no i can imagine now he's gonna want to he's gonna want to get me a robin costume or or i've got a better one i've got a better one not, the robin, to, not the robin to um uh, not the robin to peter nardi's batman i got it the Penfold to Peter Nardi's Danger Mouse. That's the one I'm going for. I was hoping for Bucky to Winter Soldier. No, mate. No, we're going for Danger Mouse and Penfold. I'm sorry. That's the way it is. Penfold. Um, Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can can, can deal with that. I I, I genuinely did not see that one coming. I genuinely (laughs) didn't see that one coming there. That that was right out of left field, that was. Yeah, right. Nobody, most people only watching this are going to wonder what the hell I'm talking about. Who's Penfold? Exactly. But you've done so much more. So I want to start at the very beginning. Okay. Start right at the beginning of your career. And I want to ask you your origin story. Wayne, what got you into magic? So uh, my dad was a magician, but not to the degree that I am. Um, He did shows, local shows. This was about 12 years before I was born, um, or about eight years maybe, because my oldest brother was born. Um, But he would do shows, and then he did a show for the Cambridge Caravan. So he was like a local guy. He might do like four shows a year, you know, that kind of thing. Um, This is back in the the late 50s, early 60s sort of time. Um, Just married to my mum, come out of the Navy, moved back to England. And I think he was still in the Navy. And he did, um, yeah, he would have been in the Navy still, around the area, and he would do a few shows and stuff. And um, he did a show for the Cambridge Caravanning Club. And there was a young boy there whose whose mum was dating a magician, and he knew all the tricks, and he destroyed my dad's confidence. So my dad never performed again. But when I was eight, he taught me how to make a thimble disappear. You know, just a, just a basic thimble vanish and make it vanish. And I don't have a thimble here to show it. I should have prepared that. Um, but yeah, he, he showed me a thimble and I learned the thimble vanish. And then he gave me all of his tricks, which they were, they were basically a 60s magic kit pre Paul Daniels. I think it was called Hanky Panky. A lot of his tricks came out. So he wasn't even, uh, again, back then there wasn't like, thousands of magic shops but he didn't have all the professional props either and we used them as toys me and my other brother and we just played with them and then they were thrown away and it was about it wasn't long after they were got rid of when I was 12 that um I got back into magic in a big way so I was uh, playing with my mate Jason in the park we were about 12 years old 11 years old kicked the football into a garden we looked over the wall it was a real mess we went and knocked on the door the woman said if you can find it you can keep it we found six of them we sold the other five to other kids in the area. Um, so I went into the garden. She was in the kitchen. I was literally just hossing these balls over the over the wall back to my mate Jason. Um, and then um, I had this brain, brainstorm. I said to the lady, like, it's coming up on Easter holidays. We'll, um, me and my mate will come in and cut out all the weeds out of your garden, if you'd like. And so she said, OK, I'll give you £10 each a day if you cut out all the weeds. But you've got to work the day. So we worked really hard all week and we blitzed her her garden and while we were there her son came home from school he was at a boarding school and it was a very prestigious boarding school she was a very wealthy lady and um every term at this school they have a different speaker come in so they learn calligraphy they learn origami and then this month the guy just learned some magic and he taught me the french the french drop and i was hooked and then when he came back on the next term, he was about a year younger than me. When he came back the next term, um, I'd learned the retention vanish and a few other bits as well. Uh, and the unequal equal ropes. And I showed them to him and he was like, oh, my God, you're so much better than me already. Uh, and that kind of fed me. And, and you know, that's where it all started. Um, me and Jason did a, uh, did a little act together. Uh, he soon didn't want to carry on with it. So he left and went played football again. I carried on with the magic. And that was really the start of how I got into magic. Okay, and then obviously you you were 12, 13 at this point. So I imagine all the way through sort of big school, all the way through secondary school, you were you were like really passionate about it. Yeah, so I mean, it took over my life in a big way. And I was doing magic, you know, at every opportunity. I remember being, a, I remember being um, maybe about 10 or 11, um, me and a bunch of my schoolmates, my classmates, 
um, kept on putting on plays at, at middle school. So we had primary, middle and upper, uh, and we were putting on lots of plays. So I think there was automatically a dramatic flair there already. Uh, I remember I remember in the last play we did, um, we needed an iceberg. So for the whole first act, I was some character. And then for the whole second act, we needed this iceberg to keep moving around the floor. So I was the iceberg and I had this white silicon mask on and a, black, a white bed sheet with my head poking through a hole in it. And, I literally, and I'm sitting on a skateboard and I'm literally just rolling around the stage, around the floor area um, as this iceberg. I had no idea what I was doing, but um, yeah, it, I, I remember people seemed to like it. Um, so I think there was automatically a natural flair there. I liked the dramatic side of things. I'm shocked to this day that I didn't go and do drama when I went to senior school. I did art instead. Um, but I think I was drawn quite towards, I couldn't draw and I really wanted to. And I thought if I do art, I might learn it. And the art teacher was pretty fit and I quite fancied that. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> that might have more to do with it. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, uh, yeah, it, it did. When, when I got to upper school, um, you know, I always had a pack of cards on me. I was always doing magic in the playground. I was always showing people tricks. Um, and, and it's funny because there's a few guys, I, I still live in the town where I grew up and I see people in the pub and guaranteed if I'm in the pub and I'm doing a few tricks at the bar or, or whatever, people come over. I'm one of those people, if people come up to me, I'll show a trick, of course I'll do a trick for you. Um, and, and, and guaranteed every time it'll be, oh, I remember uh, end, of, end of summer term and the math teacher said, oh, go on, Wayne, do a few tricks for everybody. And Wayne got up and did a few tricks for everybody. And there's always those kind of stories from, from my time at, at school that, that I was remembered as the magician. As a, I got a lot of grief for it as well. I got a lot. Of, so this is this is um, middle eight, 80s now, uh, 87, 88, 89, 90. Um, and I was getting a lot of grief and bullied. You know, oh, you think you're special because you do magic, you know, that kind of stuff. And um, there was just two, one or two people who really believed in me. Uh, one guy uh, sadly died, Sean, lovely guy. Another, his best friend, Paul, who I recently saw at a wedding, actually. And he was at the wedding. And he was like, I always told you you had to do this because we could see it back then that you were meant to do this, you know? And it's those kind of comments that they really do. At the time, they really fuel you and they really push you forward. Um, and then on the, on, the, on the reverse side of it, when you look back, then you go, yeah, you know, people did see, because you never see it yourself, you know? My dad was a military man. And even though he'd done magic, telling him that I wanted to be a professional idiot was probably the hardest thing I ever did. You know, my dad wanted me to go into the Navy like my brother had done. And, and he was pushing me that way. We were in the sea cadets. The whole family was in the sea cadets. Um, and, and yeah, you know, it was really, it was, it was expected that I was going to follow suit and be, and, and you know, be a Matlow. Um, so telling him that I wanted to, you know, do magic. And he accepted it. He accepted it. I think he was quite pleased when I went to work on the ships doing magic because I kind of fulfilled both, you know, I ticked both boxes. Um, and he, and I got him, trips on the ship they I'd get my mum and dad to come on the ship regularly and they would sail around to different places with me and you know he was always very proud my dad my dad would uh, bore you to tears with how proud he was of me but he would never tell me that so he would never tell me how proud he was he did once actually in Spain we I took him to Benidorm and we sat on the balcony of the hotel about four o'clock in the morning and uh, uh, we were drinking sangria and stuff and my dad was like how are you going to get up at seven o'clock in the morning I was like, it's just what I do. And he was like, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't live this lifestyle. I said, yeah, you did in the Navy. You know, you'd work your hours and you'd do your stuff. And you, you just do it. It's what you do. And he said, I'm very proud of you. And I remember a tear in my eye because it's the only time, you know, he ever told me that. Um, yeah. But there was nobody else about, so maybe I should knock a mark off that. <laughs> but yeah, if he was if he was on here now and I went away, he would tell you all the stories. And you know, unfortunately, he passed away as well about fifteen years ago, which is why I came back to England. Um, well, let's, let's not get too far ahead of that. Sorry, sorry, I left England yet. I babble, I babble. So no, no, that's fine. I, I look at this. I I mentally prepared myself that my job here is basically to keep you on track. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So so I left school. Uh, so, 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 so one question you yes. left school you said that you were really passionate about doing magic when you were in school yes was it in your head i'm going to be a professional magician or was it this i can't make money from magic this is going to be a hobby and you were kind of thinking about other ways that you could because you know what money never even came into my head about this stage i just wanted to do magic okay you no know, 
And, and that's all I could say. Now, I come from Newmarket, which is a horse racing town. And even to this day, right now, if you're on Facebook and you go to a Newmarket group, you'll see lots of posts about how Newmarket isn't, for the people who live here, uh, it's not just a horse racing town. It's where they live. We're, we're losing our high street. There's lots of inner town politics because the town council seem to think we're just a horse racing town and we're not. So when I was at the school, I went to see my careers officer and I said, I want to be a professional magician. And even he said, oh, you're not going in the Navy then. And I went, no, because it was again, even the school expected me to follow suit. You know, they knew I was in the cadets and all that kind of stuff. And um, I did work experience with the Navy, which I wasn't happy about. I hated it. Um, and then my careers advice teacher, he said to me, um, look, Wayne, I'm going to, there's no easy way to say this to you, but you can't, you can't do magic for a living unless you're Paul Daniels. That's it. Yeah. Unless you're a big superstar, you cannot make a living. So I've got you an interview at the jam factory at the top of the town and you're going to go there on Saturday or on Thursday or whenever it was, and you're going to have an interview with their, their people. OK, and if you're smart, you'll take a job there and forget this nonsense. So I was a bit livid. Uh, I turned up. To, I went. I, I, I followed the rules. So I go along to the interview. I'm there and the guy sits down. And the first question he asked is, why do you want to work here? And I said, I don't. <laughs> and he went, that's not the normal answer we get. And I said, I don't, I've been told I've got to come here for an interview from the school. And so he opens the file and he looks at it and he goes, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We've got a few of you coming up here. He goes, uh, okay, yeah, okay. Well, you know, it's an easy job. He said, you don't want to work here. What do you want to do then? And I said, I want to be a magician. And he went, that's a good one. No, really, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be a magician. He said, do you do magic? I went, yeah. He said, can you show me a trick? I went, yeah. Pack of cards, boom. One 30 phase ambitious card routine later. <laughs> uh, no, I did a couple of quick tricks for him. And he went, you're bloody good. He said, you're really good. He said, you should go and do this. I said, well, my teacher said, I can't do it. And he said, well, don't listen to your teacher. What does he know? He just teaches because he can't. He said, go out there, follow your dream, do whatever you have to do. He said, if you come back here and work in this factory, when you leave in September, if you're here, he goes, I will make your life hell and you will hate every second of it. He said, I will be the worst person you'll ever work for because you should not be here. You should be following your dream. Wow. And I left that interview thinking, why is the guy at the jam factory giving me better careers advice than the careers advice guy at the school? You know what I mean? Why how is that happening? Um, and but it was the it was the kick in the backside that I needed. I got, I got a very lucky break. Uh, so from there, I wanted, at that point, I was doing a few card tricks and stuff. I was doing a bit of close up, um, even before, I was doing table hopping before table hopping was really a thing in the UK. And I don't want to try and claim anything here. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just doing it. I was 15 years old. I was working in a nightclub that had shows like Jim Davis and Chubby Brown. Newmarket Cabaret Club was the, the biggest uh, cabaret venue in East Anglia. Um, but I really wanted to do kid shows because I, my friend at the Magic Club did kids shows and he said it was good money and it was regular and, you know, week to week. So I went to work at my, my primary school that I went to. Um, I got a job at the primary school working in there as a, as a volunteer um, to get experience working with children and to learn how to deal with kids. And I learned a lot. I remember there was a lady there. She's still there, Jill, actually. She's a lovely lady. She was there when I was a kid and she's still there now, a TA. And she walked into a classroom and it was the, the year sixes um, or year fives. And she walked in. So it's the oldest, uh, this because again, it's primary, middle and upper. So year five was the top year. Um, they're all making a lot of noise. They're all the biggest in the school. Um, and she just walks into the classroom, I'm with her. And it's my first day. And uh, she walks in and she doesn't raise her voice. She just goes, everybody sit down in, she, in your seats now. And the room just went. <laughs> and I looked at her like, she had just given me the treasure of the Sierra Madre. I was like, I've got to learn how to do that. She didn't shout. She didn't raise her voice. There was so much respect for her in that room. And when she asked for quiet, there was quiet. I was like, that's what I need to learn. That's, that's, 
how you treat that's how you deal with kids you know and so um i worked in school i did other jobs for them as well i did um i did uh, i looked after a little boy with spina bifida cerebral palsy i worked with uh, one of the first dyspraxic children uh, or recognized dyspraxic children in the country uh, i'm credited with discovering that dyspraxia was on the autism spectrum um through a thesis that i wrote for the coventry university so i did i was there for a couple of years and i and i the, the real reason i was there i say it was a bit of a scam but not a bad scam see my belief was as well there's 180 kids in that school and every single one of those kids has a birthday party and if they all love me and think i'm amazing who are they going to want at their birthday party and it worked so i wasn't getting paid for my week at the school but i was learning a lot and then after school and at weekends i was rammed every single week with birthday parties because every kid wanted me at their birthday party wayne's yeah. my best mate i want in there you know and it was great one minute i'm kicking a football around the, the playground with them next minute i'm getting paid out for doing a for doing a show for them um and then i did a, a talent competition in newmarket at the cabaret club um i was doing i'd done a talent competition a couple of years before and they'd offered me a job going around the tables doing magic before the main act and I did that for a long time. So that's why I learned my close up really. And I was learning new tricks all the time, making up tricks and performing around the tables. And I was 15, 14, 15, but I looked 18, 19. I always looked a bit older. Um, and so I had no problems in there. And I got to meet all the acts and they were really lovely. And yeah, I did do the table hopping. And then um, big Tim Lane, who was the compare said, we've got another, we're doing another talent night. We want you to do it. So I said, okay. And I did it and I came third um but one of the guys who was representing a singer came to me and said um another agent that he works with was looking for a magician for north sea ferries and i should audition for it and so tim drove me to coventry uh and i did my audition and i got the job on north sea ferries and that's when i left so i was i was 19 20 i uh, left home and i i went onto the ships Wow, which is a big leap, and I don't know how long you did the ships for, but I know I, I I've done ships in the past, and you get good quick. Yes, you have to. You have to get good quick, else if you don't, it's a horrible experience. So I, I was booked to do an hour's kids show every night, and half an hour close up in the piano bar later on in the evening. Um, so the ship sailed at five and docked at nine in the morning and then sailed again at five that night um and i was on one ship and a kids entertainer from preston called paul marlowe taz was on the other ship and he hated me uh because i was loud i was completely hyperactive i was non-stop magic when we all go for a cup of tea in the the the, the port i'm still doing tricks and stuff and he, and he was much more reserved and he hated me uh i think I think, looking back, I probably really was annoying. I was always telling Joe, I'm, I was just me. I was just being me. Uh, me and Paul now, like he's like my brother now. I love him to bits. We're really good friends. I go to him for advice. He comes to me for advice. He's one of he's one of the best kids entertainers in the country, um, and and just absolutely amazing. And I love him to bits. Um, he was. Uh, we were walking back up to the ship. This was about two weeks in, and we were walking back up to the ship. Um, and we walk up the gangplank and I go to the right and he goes to the left. But as we're getting towards the gang, the gangplank, the gangway, um, he happened to mention to his mate in the band that he was really having problems with this trick um, called um, Colour Monty. So I said, well, what, what's, what's the wrong with it? And he kind of looked at me and he went, all right. And he showed me and I said, are oh, you doing that bit wrong? Try doing this. If you do that bit and that bit, then that, that makes it a lot easier. And he went, oh, I didn't even think about doing it like that. And I said, well, that's the way I was taught how to do it, you know? And he said, oh, no, I really like that. That makes it so much easier. And because he was just a kid's entertainer, he didn't really know a lot of close up. So giving him that access to that one trick meant now that he'd expanded his repertoire massively. And um, as they walked away, I heard the guy in the band say, listen, Taz, you might not like him, but the guy does know his stuff. And then from that day, we would have dinner every day together, every other day together, drinks and all the time. We just spent, we were always together, non-stop, uh, whenever we were in the same dock, um, which was every other day. And uh, and yeah, a, a true friendship was born. So wow, okay, yeah, North Sea Fairs was great. It was rough. It was hard. It's like 
in my books I call it the working men's club of the sea you know it's that kind of venue it's a it's a it's an, a ferry sailing out of hull <laughs> you know you're not getting you're not getting the prime guests on there you're getting the uh you're getting the the booze cruisers and the the, the lorry drivers and the dockers and they're from the north and they are going to rip you to shreds and they did and I loved it I loved it but I learned how to do a proper kid show again you've got to get quick good quick and I learned I learned you know the, the good stuff and you know I, I was booked to do half an hour close up every night I was in there probably most of the night I mean what else are you going to do sit in your cabin you know this is before streaming stuff and you know I did have a video I had a cassette video cassette player in my cabin that I took with me everywhere I went and about and a suitcase that was just full of videos uh, all these films and that that I would watch um but yeah it was it was yeah I'd just go down to the, the bar and and just just perform all night and that's where you learn again you know you, if you want to learn a trick you can practice it as much as you want at home go down to your local pub and perform it and within within a very short time you will have it down because you've oh, got to for sure 100 percent. so where did you move to after doing the ships so well i was on north sea ferries for the summer and then i finished north sea ferries and I was uh, literally, my brother, I didn't drive. I didn't drive until about uh, 13 years ago. Um, I actually passed my driving test exactly one year to the day before my daughter was born. So I can always work it out how, old, how long I've been driving. Um, uh, my brother came up the hole to pick me up, my, one of my little brothers. And we were driving back and I just got a mobile phone, a horrible Motorola thing. And... Uh, so this is 90, 95, uh, yeah, 95, I'd say. Yeah, it was 95. I'm driving home, and it's a four hour drive, and we get about an hour out of Hull, and my phone rings, and it's my agent, a guy called Mike Jason, and he says, where are you? And I said, I've just left Hull. And he went, good, where are you going? And I went, home. And he goes, where's home? I went, Newmarket. He went, no, 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 that's not gonna work. Go to Gatwick, I've got a flight for you. You go to Benidorm for the winter. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Yeah. Just go to Benidorm. Yeah, there's a flight there. So I've got loads of stuff. Don't worry about it. We'll get it all shipped over. So I drove to Benidorm. Uh, I drove to Benidorm, drove to Gatwick, got on the plane, flew to Benidorm. I didn't need my kids stuff. So my brother took that stuff home um, and I flew up to Benidorm and I hated it. I was there for, I was booked for six months there and I hated it. They lied to me. They told me they needed a close up magician over there. When I got over there, they didn't even know I was a magician. Um, and what it was, it was the in-house hotel entertainment. So I'm just a magician. I don't know how to call bingo or do a quiz. I don't even know how to use a microphone. I didn't use a microphone on the ships because there wasn't ever that many, that many kids. So I'd have a small group, about 20 kids there. And I've got a good loud voice. Um, and I never bothered. And I was in, I hated it. And then I suddenly realized, hang on a second, you've got an opportunity here to learn. And that day, a guy turned up. I was living in this lovely four-bedroom apartment on my own, overlooking Benidorm. And then this guy turned up, and they said, oh, this guy's moving in with you today to make sure the, the, the flat's clean. And it was. I kept it immaculate. And this guy turned up, and he had two bin bags. That's all he had, two black bin bags. And he, he walked into the front room, and he tipped out the first one, and it was just full of clothes. And he tipped out the second one, and I swear to you, the second bin bag was twice as full as the first bin bag and it was just full of loose playing cards and they all just went crack on the floor and until the day we moved out of that flat that pile of cards never moved it literally stayed there the pile of cards and that was Rodney Piper really wow he he was working in Tenerife I think as a rep and he got the job and he went, they went, right, we'll fly. No, 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 don't worry about it. I'll get myself there. And he got himself a flight with his travel company and he turned up. And um, he said, uh, well, where's good in town? I said, I've not really been into town. He went, how long have you been here? I went, two, three weeks. Well, you've not been in town yet. I went, no, I don't know, just do my stuff and then come back in and practice. He goes, no, no, no. This is like two o'clock in the afternoon. He goes, do you like Ali Oli? Well, I've never tried it. He goes, come on. And he took me into town. And we went to this little cafe and we had Ali Oli with a bread pan to dip it in and a couple of beers. And we sat there and again, just a true friendship was formed right there. And um, 
he was like, oh, what do you like doing? Bingo quiz, you know, what, what should I do tonight? And I went, I, I don't really do the bit. I don't talk on the microphone. He said, what? And he goes, well, I'm going to teach you how to talk on the microphone. And over the next six months, he gave me my career. He gave me everything I needed. And for that, I will be, me and Rodney have had fallouts in the past, but we're good friends. I love him to bits. He's like a brother as well. I would kill for him. But we have fallouts, obviously, you know, as friends do. Um, but I owe him my career, really, uh, because he gave me the instruction that nobody else taught me. So he taught me how to, and, and it was great. I, I talk about this in my Heckler book. Um, we had one night, I'm on the microphone, and he taught me how to use the microphone, and I'm doing a quiz. And this guy came in, and he, the guy had turned up the night before and had got into a fight. It's an all-inclusive hotel. First night is always a bit rough. This guy was a scouser. I swear to you right now, he looked like one of the Boswells. He had the bobble perm. He had the swagger. He comes in, hi, dad, hi, ta, lad. Right? And he, he came and sat down right in the front. And I knew that this guy had potential to get violent. So now I'm cacking it. I found out that adrenaline was brown. And I started doing the quiz and he started talking and he started heckling. And then he did that for the whole two weeks he was there. And I swear to you, it was the best time I've ever had. I gave him grief back. He never went too far. He was never abusive. It was all cheeky little Scouse comments. You know what the Scousers are like. And it was, and it was perfect. And it made me fall in love with interaction with the audience. Yeah. And I've never, to this day, I've never had the same connection as I had with Wally. I would love to meet him. His name was Wally. I'd love to meet him again. I would hug him and I would thank him. He was just perfect. He was a, the perfect idiot. And, and, you know, and people were laughing and I would, I quickly discovered that I was quite quick with a comeback and I was giving him comebacks all the time. And it was going backwards and forwards and it was never too much. It never disrupted the night. And it was only during the quiz. And I was supposed to do one night quiz, one night bingo, one night quiz, one night bingo. But I would do the quiz every night for those two weeks that he was there. And it was just amazing. And I loved it. It was just, just brilliant. Um, so Benidorm that, Benidorm, that winter taught me a lot and, 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 and gave me a foundation to build on. Um, I was already good at the magic. I, I knew what I was doing there. But now I'd learned the skills that I need. I learned about sound equipment, lights. And anybody who's watching this, um, especially the, the younger guys or people who haven't got much experience, if you're thinking about, oh, I want to do stage magic or I want to do get on stage and do stuff, my one bit of advice is don't watch Copperfield or, or, or any of those guys. Watch dancers and singers and comedians because that's where I learn how to walk onto stage. I'd watch the dancers coming out and taking their positions or the comedians walking on, you know, hey, how you doing, waving and stuff like that and interacting as they're walking. They're not waving at anybody in particular. They make it look like they are. They do what I call the politician point. When politicians come out, they go, hey, you know, they can't see, they've got lights and they can't see anybody, but they're doing that because they're making a connection with the audience. And I learned all of that from, from watching these guys. And that's where I learned it all. Um, and I learned so much. Um, then I went back to England. So I did six months over there. Um, and then they offered me a job, but I'd already got a contract back on North Sea Ferries again. So I went back to England. Um, and uh, But me and Rodney kept in touch. It was really, really good. And then, so that would have been 2000, uh, 1996. And then I went to Scandinavia. I was in Scandinavia for about three years until 99. Um, and I didn't really come home. Um, it was actually quite funny, just a quick side story. I was, uh, again, my agent phoned me, he said, you're going to Denmark. You need to get to Denmark and you need to find somewhere to stay for two nights and then you join the ship. I was like, okay. And like now, if you said to me now, Wayne, I want you to go to Denmark for, and do a, do a show over there, I would plan every step of that journey, right? <laughs> I'd, I'd get off the phone, Dutch, Craig, I'm on it now. Put down, right, I need a hotel in Copenhagen, do it all, right? Didn't even think about any of that. Just literally drove straight from one ship to the dock in Harwich, got on the ship to head over to Denmark. Then not, not a <coughs> clue where I'm going to stay or how I'm going to get there. I've got to go to this medical center and have a full examination to get to my, um, what they call the Siemens passport done. 
don't know where it is, but I'll find it. Got all my stuff. So I get on the, the, the boat and there's a, a guy that I'd worked with on North Sea Ferries, one of the piano players. So we traveled across the, on the boat and then I got off and went and did this medical thing, got on, on the train and there he is on the train. So I thought, all right, Roy. So we're sitting on the train now and we're heading off to uh, Copenhagen. And um, I suddenly have an idea. Oh, the girl singer from the band I was on two ships ago, she lived in Copenhagen. She'd know somewhere to stay. So I phoned her. Hey, Jenny, it's Magic Wayne. How you doing, Magic Wayne? Ah, where are you? I'm actually on the way to Copenhagen. Do you know anywhere that's like, you know, good to stay, cheap and good? I need somewhere cheap and good to stay, a hostel or something. And she went, ah, no, forget that. I'm going to text you my address. My boyfriend's there. Stay and sleep on my couch. I thought, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about it. There's food in the fridge, drink. He'll get you drunk. Don't worry about it. I'll take them and let him know you're coming. So, wow. So now I've got accommodation for two nights. But then I never really came back to England. For those, for those three, four years I was up in Scandinavia, um, I'd get off the ship and I'd go and stay in Ulborg or, um, or um, Aarhus, where the crew members lived. And they'd always like, oh, don't go home, come and meet my family, come and stay with us. And I, was, I would literally just sofa jump all around Denmark. Well, I've got three weeks between ships. Where are you staying with me for a week? And then why don't you go stay with Jasper? Oh, OK, yeah, we'll do that, you know. So um, just, just an epic adventure. Just, just absolutely mind blowing. And then Rodney came onto the ship, and he suffers really badly on ships. He doesn't, he hates them. And he offered me a, uh, asked me to help him recruit for Salou for two thousand. And um, we took Matt Edwards down there. Um, I've been, I'd known Matt since he was thirteen. He was a member of my local club. Um, we took him down, and uh, he auditioned. And uh, Mike Rose went along as well, and he got the job as well. And I thought, you know what? I quite fancy a summer working with these guys. So I gave up the ships and moved to Salute. And that was then the next chapter in the book. You bounced around something rotten, mate. I mean, you, wow. I mean, you're all over the place. I mean. And, and, and just literally just going with the flow. Nothing planned. You know, my dad would literally text me and say, are we going to see you this year? And I would put probably not, you know. Probably, probably not. And in the first couple of years in Spain, it was just the, well, actually the first year, it was just the summer. Then I came back for the winter and I actually had my first winter off um, with no work. And then the, the, we, I went back for the second year in Salou. And th that year, so the first year was, was kind of interesting. I was only in Salou for a few months and then Rodney sent me to Lorette de Mar and I finished off the year in Lorette de Mar on my own. I ran a hotel on my own. And then the following year, I went back to Lorette de Mar um, almost immediately, but to the hotel next door to the one I'd been in. And it was while I was in there that Rodney phoned me and said, we need you in Benidorm. And if Rodney's watching this, I'm, 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 this was the time I think Rodney got the best out of me. Um, my thing was always going into a venue and sorting it out, but not staying there too long. I go in, I work. I change it, I get it all sorted, and then I go and think, I'm a fixer, I'm a fireman. I go in, I sort the problems. So there was a hotel in Benidorm, um, the Flamingo Oasis, and it's a three, uh, 30 stories high, three, 4,000 guests, one of the biggest hotels in Europe, um, holiday hotels, and it, it was what well, it was at the time, and it was epic. And we went down there and they were scoring between 80 and 95, 96 on everything. So it's like top marks and everything, apart from entertainment, which was scoring 24. So the guy who was in charge of the tour company said, who was a friend of ours, said, you bring these guys in or we're pulling. And so they, they put us in there. And I literally had to fight with them every single day. They wanted flamingo, a uh, flamenco four, three or four times a week. And I'm like, these are English holiday makers. They'll watch it once. That's all they want it. So you have it one, we have a two week program. So I went in and um, me and Rodney went down there for a few days and then Rodney left and I stayed and um, we took the program in and I had no team um, apart from the team that was already in the hotel. And we went, I went in and literally one by one, I sacked all the team members until it was just me. And then Rodney flew in a couple of girls to work with me, three girls to work with me. 
um, and, and, and we ran it. And then I had a guy called Matt come down. Matt Thief came down. He was the most annoying guy you've ever met. He was a, he was a, he was a, 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 a yam yam. Yam yam man, yam yam. And he was like, and he'd been in Salou for a couple of years and no one could deal with him. Rodney sent him down to me to deal with him. And I got, I got, I still did get on right with Matt. He's annoying still, but he, <laughs> he's got a heart of gold. He's got a heart of gold, but he's so annoying. In fact, the hotels hated him. They, they hated him so much. And then we had to share a room because we were the only lads. Um, so the girls were in one room, me and Matt in the other room. And uh, one day they called me down to the office. They were always trying to sack Matt. Send your way in, send your way in. You need to get rid of Matt. Why now? I have a, the, the people don't like him. Come with me. Walk out to the balcony. There's Matt. He's got 60 people around him playing pool. The people like him. Leave him alone. You just count the money. Don't you worry about it. Right? And that's literally how the conversations would go. I was fighting with him every single day. And um, one day they called me in. Senor Wayne, Senor Wayne, come here. What is it today? You need to get rid of Matt. Why do we need to get rid of Matt? Uh, well, the cleaner went into your room. Right? The cleaner's not supposed to go into our room because we've got all of our stuff in there. So the cleaner knows. We keep the rooms clean. The room is always clean. The cleaner doesn't go into the room. Ah, uh, she knew. She didn't know. She went in to clean the room. She looked under the bed, and there was Jack Daniels and Baileys and all other alcohol. Matt's an alcoholic. And I went, Matt doesn't drink. That's my bed. And they kind of went, uh-oh. <laughs> I'm not an alcoholic, but sometimes I don't like to go into town. If I've got paperwork to fill out for Rodney, I'm going to sit on my balcony and do it. But if I want to have a drink, I'm going to have a drink. All the bottles are full. They're not empty. If I was an alcoholic, they'd be empty. So leave Matt alone. Just shut up. Get on with what you're doing. And don't worry about him because he's doing a good job. And that's how it went. And then we did winter there. We did the, we did the winter. Rodney came down and worked. And Joe and a few others. And we did the, the winter. And then Rodney pulled me out and took me back to Salou in 2002. And... That's when we opened House of Illusion, um, and that's which I love. House of Illusion, it's moved a couple of times. I, I had a small percentage share of the first one, um, and and it was great. Um, but looking back, I think Rodney's mistake was pulling me out of the venue, he would have done better with me keeping me going from venue to venue. Um, because after that, my I think because when I was working on the ships, I would change ship every single month. Once my feet went to sleep, everything kind of started, you know. But I did, I did another five years out there with him, and then, and then I came. But my dad died, so I, I came back to England, um, and that was the end of of my travelling career, I should say, in as much as long term overseas work. Um, I think if I hadn't had my daughter, I wouldn't be in England now. I think I'd have probably moved away and have would set up in Spain or Italy or. Portugal or you know Australia or Thailand or somewhere I would have gone somewhere and set up um but my daughter came along and well, as you know you know kids take take preference they really do so you come back you've you've spent the best part of your career traveling around 15 15 years, 15 years 15 years abroad years honing your kids show honing your cabaret show honing your close-up show you're now a kick-ass performer but all of a sudden you're coming back to the UK must have been a scary time because you're coming back. No one knows who Wayne Goodman is. No, no, no. One, no you I'd ain't... lost all my clients in Newmarket who knew me when I was 16, 17. You know, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, oh, are you still doing the magic? You know, it's sort of like they've not seen me for 15 years. The, the, the hardest bit for me was when I was in Salou, I don't know if this claim is correct, but I'm going to make it anyway. It's a bold claim, but thanks to Rodney. And the infrastructure he had at the time in Salou, I think I might have been one of the busiest working magicians in the world. Because Rodney had, Rodney had so many hotels and so many bars that he provided entertainment for, including the two shows at House of Illusion every single night. I was doing either four or five shows a night, every single night. And on my nights off, I would always I would normally cover a show. So I'd always be doing, so I was working, you know, if you took Monday to Friday, I think my day off was a Tuesday. So let's say Monday to Saturday, five nights. Um, I was doing 25 shows, <laughs> you know, our cabaret shows every single night. Um, it, it was, it was crazy. I could put a new show in at 
first show Monday, which would be a normally would be a bar show, I could put a brand new trick in there, and by last show Friday, that trick is fully worked in. You know what would normally take you a couple of months because you've got gigs here and gigs there and a few days off here and a few days off there. I was working; it was it was mental. And I remember I worked it out one year. I did hundreds of shows, and people are going, "Oh, Copperfield does three hundred shows a year." And I'm thinking, "God, I'd love to do three hundred shows a year <laughs> because in six <laughs> months I'm doing four hundred and twenty-five, whatever it was. I can't remember now, but in six or in eight months I'm doing four hundred and twenty-five. You know, and it, and it it was just mental and that's incl not including like the daytime shows we did an extra special daytime shows and I, I learned hypnosis I did hypnosis over there but yeah coming back from that to then coming back to you know not not being able to perform that many times and you know you're used to the it's a drug the adrenaline is a boost and then you come back and all of a sudden you're like nobody knows me um Dave, we'd, I'd befriended Dave Penn he'd been over a couple of times and he gave me a couple of quite well paid gigs which got me started, which was great. And I you know, really appreciate him doing that for me. Uh, and then he got me to consult. I was his first consultant on his, um, his first Street Magic DVD. Um, and I'm on the DVD as well. Um, so we did that. And then, um, and then I found that people in my local area started remembering me. So I did a, I did a publicity stunt. Um, thinking out of the box, I thought, well, I want to do something big. I want to do something flashy. I want to get my name in the paper. So I approached the local mayor and I asked him to come to the library in Newmarket. The library, uh, I was speaking to a friend of mine who said the library was in a bit of dire straits and they needed something to boost their profile. The internet was just becoming more popular at this point. Um, more and more people were online. So this is uh, 2005, 2006, 2007. So, um, so the internet's becoming more popular, it's more accessible. People are going in their homes now more and more. Um, and to be honest with you, I can't tell how much people had it in their homes in the few years before that, because we didn't have, well, I wasn't here, so I don't know. But my mum and dad had just got it, or my mum had just got it, uh, my brother had just got it, so I presume it had just been coming in. Uh, and the, the library was struggling, and they wanted to do something, so I approached them and said, well, I've got an idea, and I told them. Um, and we got the local mayor to come down, and there was a big group there, about 200 people turned up for this. So I picked out a bunch of kids out of the audience and I asked them to, to grab a basket from the library and to each go and get um, five or six books in the from the library and put it in their basket um, from different sections. Yeah. So the kids, boom, like, they all went off and did it. One of the kids was friend, a daughter of a friend of mine and she had already got a basket full of books primed and she just went and picked that up and brought it out. And spoiler alert, in that basket was six books that all belonged to me, that had all been labelled up to look like library books, and there were six different book tests in there. So then oh. we took the books out. I, I did a, a equivocate force down to, down to this basket. I said to the mayor, OK, we've got rid of all those other baskets there. Um, take out the books and choose one. And whichever book he took out, I knew the book test for. As it was, he grabbed the golden one, he pulled out uh, the mother of all book tests. And so I did that on him. And then in the newspaper, it appeared, we called the tide, we, we named the effect, because they said, what, 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 what was the name of the effect? And I said, um, a word in one trillion, because there must be a trillion words in the library. So a word in one trillion. And, um, and he got me in the local newspaper. And, and that was it then, you know, people started saying, do you do children's shows? Yep. Do you do adult shows? Yep. Birthday parties. Uh, and, and within maybe a month, I've been booked about three weddings. And that was the Kickstarter for me doing weddings um, and, and, you know, and the kids shows. The cabaret shows a bit more slower, but I soon got onto the Holly Park circuit, which I was on for four or five years. Um, and then, and yeah, and then quite like the, it all went back to the, the close-up, really. So when when did you? Uh, because obviously you've literally written the book on restaurant magic, like literally written the book. At no point have you talked to me about restaurants. When did that come about? So that was when I first came back as well. So when I first came back, I knew I had to get people to know who I was. So I came up with the idea for the library, but you can't just rely on one thing. And like I said to you at the very beginning, you've got to keep moving. You've got to keep trying different things. So I wrote letters and I approached 
and I used the tactics that I talk about in the restaurant book. I went into a number of restaurants and I happened to go into Frankie and Benny's. I'd never heard of Frankie and Benny's. Um, and I walked in and I was like, oh, wow, this is a good place. And I sat at the bar, got chatting to the guy who was at the bar, did a few tricks for him. He called the manager over, a guy called Kevin, introduced me and Kevin had vision. And he was instantly on the spot, booked me for uh, Mother's Day 2008. Uh, or it might have been 2007. I got back, yeah, 2007. So he instantly booked me for 2007 Mother's Day. And he said, right, you're going to come in. So I went in and I did it. And then that was the start of a 15 year relationship with Frankie and Benny's, yeah. um, which just grew and grew and grew. Um, at one point I was working four different Frankies and Benny's in my area. And in from 2010 to 2015, any time they opened a Frankie and Benny's anywhere in the country, I was brought in to do magic on the opening night um, as an extra. So I was opening, including, okay. their, including their flagship Wembley one, which is the biggest um, one they had. Because Frankie and Benny's is part of the restaurant group. Yes. So were you also getting into Chiquitos and places Chiquitos like Chiquitos, and there was, I've, I've got a list of all the ones. So I did the Chiquitos. Old Orleans. Um, there wasn't many of those. So so for me, it was mostly um, Frankie and Benny's and Chiquitos because that's what I've got in this immediate area. So I've got Cambridge, I've got Basin Edmonds, I've got Ipswich, I've got Norwich, Thetford, Peterborough, and that's what they had around there. Um, but it, it wasn't long before staff from those restaurants started going to other restaurants and getting me to go along there as well. So then I moved into um, like Loch Fien, I've got a few restaurants around here that are a seafood restaurant. Um, and I ended up doing about four of those, five of those. Um, I got into a, a private company called Giraffe that owned three or four restaurants and I was working for them. I think they've now, they got bought out since and have become a bigger chain. Uh, but back then there were a small chain. There's only about three or four of them in the whole country. And then it expanded. Um, and I worked for other groups as well. And then Kevin moved, for, left Frankie and Benny's and he went down to a place called the Oyster Reach in Ipswich, and he took me along there as well. So now I'm working Frankie and Benny's that he got me in, and now I'm working at the Oyster Reach as well. And I was there for four years, and he then moved to the Albert and took me to the Albert as well in Colchester, but that was a bit too much of a drive. It was yeah. like quite a distance from me. So there was a young lad called Lee at my magic club. I trained him up, and I put him into the Albert. I then worked at the Oyster Reach. Um, Kevin is one of those people. Uh, when I did the, um, the, the academy for Alakazam, uh, the, um, yeah, the academy, um, I had an interview with a lady on there that I'd pre-recorded and I put it on called Kelly. And she was my manager at Frankie Bunnies and at the Oyster Reach as well. She followed Kevin. But when I, I'm gonna convert the book into a audio book, and when I do that, I'm going to include that interview in the audiobook. But I'm also going to sit down with Kevin for an hour and interview him because he is the most vision orientated manager I've ever worked with in any industry. And no matter where he goes or what he does, he makes money. He, he'll go into a restaurant and the money just pours in. He, I don't, he's got a golden touch. He really, really has. Yeah. So um, he was a big influence on me. Um, and, and it still reverberates now. He left in charge at Frankie and Benny's, a guy called Martin. Martin now runs a pub in Ipswich. I work for him. So even now, so what's 2017? That's 14, uh, 2017, yeah, so it's, um, yeah, 14 years ago. So 14 year relationship. Um, 14 years ago, I met this guy and now I'm still working for him now. Um, in three weeks time, I'm doing a wedding for a guy called Sam. He was a waiter at Frankie and Benny's. You know, these people, it, it, it all spawned from there. And I very quickly started taking notes and comparing different things in what works in one restaurant doesn't work in another one, work in this, work in that. And that became the, the, the base plan for the restaurant book. And I don't want to give her, I mean, obviously the restaurant book is still available from you. Yes. So you can still buy it. I don't want you to give away too much of the gold in there because it is brilliant. But for anybody watching this that wants to actually get their own restaurants, you know, they, they like the idea of it. Can you give us a couple of minutes of advice on? Yeah, of course, of course. And more importantly, the first book was called The Definitive Guide to Restaurant Magic. 
and I had some complaints. I had some complaints because they said, oh, I don't talk about working in America or China. Um, and um, it's not really definitive because if it was definitive, it would talk about every restaurant. So I changed it to the expert at the restaurant table, which I thought was a... <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I, I, I do like my names. You know, I like the names of things. I've got Go Compare and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, the expert at the restaurant table. Um, you know, if you're going to annoy people, you might as well go full out with it. But people like the name. Um, yeah, if if you want to, so I'll tell you what I'll do. Because um, the books are available, and I'm not. It's not going to become a sales pitch. Um, they're twenty pounds. You can get them as a download or as a as a printed edition. Um, and it will take you from approaching the restaurants to actually working in the restaurants. Tell you how to work the tables. Tell you how much you should be charging. I do a full breakdown. An analytical breakdown of different restaurants and how much they make on a week and how much they make on a weekend. We'll look at how much they can afford, etc. Uh, I've really done all the work for it. So you just read it and it's all done for you. Um, I, won't, I won't tell you what you need to do. I'll give you a quick two minutes to tell you what you mustn't do. Yeah. So if you want to work in a restaurant, like I said, I went into Frankie and Benny's and I spoke to the guy at the end of the bar. Any restaurant that's got like a pub or a chain like Frankie and Benny's has its regulars who go in all the time. If you go in and ask for the manager, he's going to come out thinking there's a problem. He's going to have, he's going to have his defences up. It's not a good starting point. If you go in and do some magic for the bar staff and chat up the, the guy at the end of the bar, the regular, when you leave, that guy has the ear of the manager. Yeah. But when he says, he tells the manager everything. Oh, Jimmy works behind the bar, lazy. Boom, Jim's gone. Oh, that, that girl over there, she's working twice as hard as everybody else. Boom. You know, the manager knows and trusts this guy because he sees everything. He's there all the time. So if I do a few tricks for him and chat him up a little bit, then when I leave, he's going to go, that guy was amazing. And he says he works restaurants. You need to get him, but he left his card. And that's exactly what happened. And Kevin, Kevin actually called me before I left, actually, and we had a chat. But he was fully prepared to ring me and call me back in if he needed to. Don't turn up wearing your full costume full of tricks. Walk in with one or two tricks. Yeah. Do a couple of tricks at the bar. Chat to the people at the bar. If you can get the manager to come over and watch a trick, great. Don't jump in with a proposal. What you need to do is you need to make a suggestion. Oh, this is a really lovely restaurant you've got here. I love it. I love how it's a nice mix. You've got couples over there and a family over there. Have you ever thought about any entertainment? You haven't. Well, I mean, you know, magic's a great thing. It's non-intrusive. You know, if people don't want to watch it, they don't have to. Um, you know, maybe if, if it's something you'd be interested in having a chat about, I'd love to come in and have a chat with you about it another day. Give them your card and leave. Make them chase you. Okay. They've, they've already bitten. They've already, they've already can see the potential now, but you're not putting them on the spot going, book me, book me, please. He might have to, or she might have to go to their manager and say, I've found this guy, I think he'd be brilliant to work in here. I need some discretionary funds. Can we make it happen? Yes, we can. Okay, Wayne, can you come over? I'd love to have a chat with you. Brilliant, we'll, we'll do it, boom, and, you, and it's done. Yeah. And don't, don't go in there with big props or anything either. Don't go in there with your fire wallet or anything like that, because it's just, it's too much for them. You need to, you need to give them a little nibble and then let them take the bite and then they will come to you. Right. And then you're in a much better position. The only other thing I'll say about restaurants is, in the magic community, and I'm really sorry to have to say this, but there are a lot of people who talk a lot of rubbish, especially when it comes to fees. And working as a residency in a restaurant, you're not going to earn, unless you get lucky, you're not going to earn a proper fee wage for being in there. But I was at Frankie and Benny's, and a woman was at a table, and she called me over, and she was like, uh, do you do other shows? And I was like, yes. And she said... We've got a trade show coming up. We'd love to book you for it. And I was like, brilliant, I can do that. And the lady, um, Katie, she worked for Tobar, which is the, they own Hawkins Bazaar. So Hawkins Bazaar is the shop front of Tobar. Um, she went, we want you to do them, our magic tricks, which is just like the, the, the ball and vase, zigzag cigarette, everything I already knew. I didn't need to do any prep for it. It was brilliant. I did eight trade shows for them. 
And she came to me and she said, we've got a budget of 950 pounds a day for you. And we'll pay for everything. Hotel, drinks, food, everything. And I get 950 pounds a day. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, uh, but that was from working for a for hundred quid a day at Thanking Benny's or a three hour session, you know? So there are fringe benefits. This. Also, um, if you're working in a restaurant, you know, you're getting an opportunity to put your business card out to hundreds of people, hundreds of people who are potential bookers for you. And the, the, the biggest use I have for restaurants like this, my residencies, is um, if I've got a client who wants to book me for a wedding, but they want to see me in action, oh, is there anywhere we can come and watch you work? Yeah, come to this restaurant. Mm. You don't have to buy food, but you can if you want. Have a drink at the bar. You can watch me working a real crowd of people. Yeah, because I can't take them to a wedding to watch me. They can come watch me there. Now, the restaurants are ha happy because I'm bringing customers in. Pardon me, even if it's just for a drink. But they're, they're happy because I'm bringing customers in. They're happy because they're getting to see me in action and they're having a night out. And I'm happy because guaranteed, if they're going to make a trip down to a restaurant to watch me work in, they're going to book me by the end of it. They're all, they just need that little flip over to see me in action. That's brilliant. And, yeah. and, it, yeah, and it really works. Absolutely but, brilliant. So that was the first book. Ta -da! And, and where, I'm going to put a link down below on the screen. Where can people go to get those? So they can get them from me, uh, especially if they want the downloads, they can come directly to me and they can message me on Facebook or <laughs> on my website, waynegoodman.co.uk. Um, and you can find me there. Uh, or you can, if you can't remember my last name, you can go to Wayne the Magician. You're going to cough, please. There we go. Um, you can go to waynethemagician.co.uk and that will take you to my website as well. Uh, that's a good idea as well. If anybody's out there who does weddings and things, it's a really good tip for you. Um, my friend Juan, he's a wedding photographer. Um, he would always get, he always tells people to look at me up. He wants me at every single one of his weddings. I love Juan. He's an amazing guy. Uh, in fact, my ring light here that I've got on me now, he bought for me at the first lockdown because I needed a lamp. And he went, no, you need one. And he just bought it for me. And I was so grateful. Um, he said to me, buy another domain and link it to your website. Make it really easy. So now he said to people, oh, look up Wayne Goodman. Yeah. And they're not going to remember that. So instead, he says, go to Wayne the Magician. And it goes to my main website. It's so simple. And it's so much easier for them to, to remember Wayne the Magician. They can write that down. Yeah, there we go. I mean, they could write down Wayne Goodman as well. But you know what I mean? It's one of those. It's just nice things to remember. That's great. That's really good. Um, but yeah, I, um, if they want to buy the paperback uh, editions, then um, I will send you later on, Craig. I'll send you the link. Uh, I have a Lulu page called a Spotlight. And they can just go there and then they they print it and we'll post it directly to them. It takes about two or three days for them to print it and then two or three days to get there. Okay. So, and I, I really advise everyone do buy that because, I mean, I did restaurants for years and it's such a great way to get flight time. It's, it's a great way to get good at close-up magic. It really it's, is. Again, it's one of those things, isn't it? You know, you can, if, if, if you've got a good number, I mean, at one point I had like 11 or 12 residencies. I did the same thing as you but with the spirit group. So back in the day, I was working with all the wacky warehouses and all of the, uh, all, all of those. And I was getting in with like all of the wacky warehouses and all of the spirit group pubs. Nice. I bet they were good fun. Mm, they were great. I did some of the, uh, I did some stuff with uh, restaurant group, but it was mainly spirit group that I kind of got in with. So. Yeah. It's funny as well. If, if you do a bit of research, um, here actually, if you do, uh, let me open it up here. A little bit of research will show you. So here, so the restaurant group, Frank and Benny's, Chiquitos, uh, Blue Backers, uh, Garfunkel's, Coast to Coast, uh, also Blue Beckers, Brunning and Prize, Home Country Restaurants, uh, and Little Frankies um, are all the restaurants that are owned by the restaurant group. If you get in with one of those, the potential, and then if you get in with, uh, oh, Montez, about one, Brinker, they own Chili's and Maggiano's, Whipbread, they own Premier Inn, Table Table, Costa Coffee, Beef Eater, Tavern, Brewers, Brewers Fair, Gondola Holdings, Zizi, Ask, Pizza Express, Milano, Brian, Kettner's. You know, the list goes on and on. These, these companies, they don't just own one chain. They own multiple chains. And if you get in with one, then there is potential. As long as you've got them in your area and you're willing to do them. Like I say, around here, it was more Frankie and Benny's and Chiquitos. That was all we really had. Yeah. um a few brewers fairs but they were smaller ones but yeah um so so let me ask you a question 
Okay. You've travelled around the world. You've come back. You, you, you've basically done everything that you can to kickstart your career back in the UK. You're doing all of the restaurants. You're going out pushing weddings, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, you, you're, you're going out doing kids' parties. You're doing absolutely everything. What makes you start creating magic? Because at no point up until this point have you talked about creating magic, but we know you as a creator. You've brought a ton of stuff out through Alakazam. You've self-published things as well. What, you sound like you're very busy. You came back and you made a success of being Wayne the magician and going out and doing all of this stuff. So what made you decide to go, you know what, I'm going to take everything I know and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to sell it to a magician. I'm going to write a book and create my own competition in my area. You know, what, what, so um, I think it stems from the fact that I never had money growing up. So my family's never had money. Um, I've got three brothers. One of them's disabled. So that's always been a, a thing. You know, uh, he had to go to a special school. He's completely deaf um, and he's annoying. Uh, but he, uh, he um, I love my little brother. We call him Chewbacca because he can't speak. So, but if he takes me, it comes up as Chewbacca. I've got a Chewbacca ringtone, which everyone thinks is really cool, but very funny. If I really want to wind him up, I just do that so he can't lip read. Um, <laughs> You're the typical big brother you are, man. <laughs> he, he's twice my size and he beats the living lay down on me. No, uh, he's a teddy bear. My daughter adores him. Uncle Neil has always been her favourite. And she loves my brother, Paul. I don't really have a very good relationship with Ian. It's better now than it was, but yeah. Anyway, um, I think not having money to buy expensive tricks and to buy the, the new, you know, and again, going back to the early 90s, there wasn't like a release every week. It'd be every so often. You'd get a Supreme Magic catalogue and you'd read it. That was a great book, the Supreme catalogue. Um, I didn't have any money, so I started making up tricks. And I would invent tricks, or if there was a sale at the magic club, um, you know, a second hand sale, I'd spend 20 quid and get a couple of tricks. But more often than not, the cheaper tricks that I would buy wouldn't have instructions with them. So I'd have these props and nothing to do with them. So I would make up my own trick with them. Um, and that's, I think, where it started. When I was in, on the ships and I was doing cabaret shows, and when I was then out in Spain and I was doing cabaret shows, because some of the ships I did cabaret on as well. Um, I developed a gun trick where I would have a card selected and then I would shoot a hole through the card while the spectator was holding it. Um, and I came up with the, I came up with the hole. It's called the Wengerman gun trick. I, I just last year, actually, I retired it and I'm not going to perform it anymore. I might perform it next Wednesday. I'm going down to Crawley and I'm doing a show down there with a couple of other magicians. I might get and I might film it because I'd like to get it filmed properly as well, uh, just for my own, because I haven't got it really filmed apart from one show. Um, but for, for 28 years, I did that trick as the close of every single cabaret show I did. And it was very shocking. And at one point, nobody knows about the guns. So when I bring the gun out and fire it, the whole audience jumps. And it's a beautiful piece of comedy and it's great. Um, uh, yeah, so I've written up the instructions for it and I might sell it to a number of people, but a select number of people, and then that'll be it. I don't want everyone doing it. Um, but yeah, Nick, if I do it next Wednesday, that will be the last of the time I perform it. Um, so yeah, I developed that. I developed other tricks. I started working on ideas. Um, I had an idea for a ring flight and I wanted the ring to go into my jacket. So when I open up my jacket, I've got all the rings there. Um, and I developed a way of doing it. I found out that another guy had already done this, but his version didn't use a reel and he has to clip it on as he's doing it. Yeah, it's. I'll tell you who it is as well. Uh, it's Bax, is it Robert, Robert Bax? Bax. Robert Bax. Yeah, jewelry thief. So yeah, I, I've seen him do it. Yeah. I came up with an idea with a reel and boot inside it. Um, it was a lot easier for me. Worked better for me. Uh, and Magic Box put it out as Lord of the Bling. So that was my first actual release. But they didn't really do much with it. Um, they're still really for sale. I did try and buy the rights back to it a couple of years ago they said no and just recently um i've been contacted that they might look at re-releasing it again so that would be quite cool um so that was my first release and then i i i was trying to work out how to get a card into a sharpie and i was driving home from a gig and i was like if you know you could do like a build tube type thing with it or you know a number of different ways you could do it uh but nothing that was really buzzing me and 
I have a thing that I know when something's the right thing for something. So I've been putting out all these videos for my new book, et cetera, and I've got all these little videos that I've made. And every time I find the music, it takes me a little while, but as soon as I hear that piece of music, I know it's the right piece of music for it. Yeah. So that's it. And nothing was buzzing me. Nothing was getting me going here. And I'm thinking, yeah. And I was driving home from a gig and I suddenly thought, you are thinking about this the wrong way. Look at it the other way. Instead of trying to get the pen, the card into the pen, what's the problem? The pen. Get rid of the problem. There we are. And that was the birth of Look Sharp. And that was and that was that was it. And so I got home. Incredible I, work, you know, I mean, that's that's probably still the thing that people know you for. Yes, yes. And that it's I get I I, I I don't believe in fame. We've spoke about this privately before. I don't believe in fame. Um my 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 daughter's of the TikTok generation. So she loved it at Blackpool when people were asking me for my autograph and <laughs> like that. she finds that really, really but well, she did. Now it's embarrassing bad. Um, but you know, she did, she thought it was really cool. Thought, oh my god, you're famous. Um, but I don't really believe in fame. I've never chased fame. I've never wanted to be famous. I just wanted to be happy, which I am. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's never been my driving force. But yeah, it was it was people come up to me, you know, I, I said on the, 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 the relaunch last week, I said, um, I don't think I've ever had a single month go by where I haven't had somebody message me about Look Sharp, you know. Well, it, 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 here's a question. What made you decide to go with Alakazam? Um, you know, you had this relationship with... Um, Magic Box. Magic Box, yeah. Uh, Peter had come over to Spain in my last year and bought Holly and Harry, and Harry over. And um, Holly was great. I got Harry up in my comedy spot, A House of Illusion, and, and ripped it out of him for about 20 minutes. Um, and they loved that. And we had a good chat with them. And then me and one of the guys from House of Illusion went to Vegas and met up with Peter and Spellman, who were over there at the same time, and had breakfast with them at two o'clock in the morning. It was great. We were gambling. And they were at Magic Live, the very first one. And, um, yeah, it was great. It was a really, really good trip. And so I had a good personal relationship with Peter. Um, and, and so I think, I think I looked at Magic Box as more being like the cabaret magic shop. They had a lot of bigger props in there. and a lot. Of, they did do close up, obviously. But whenever I looked at their stuff, it was for the bigger tricks. Yeah. This chopper and all that kind of stuff. Whereas when I looked at Alakazam, it was more cards and serious close up. So I think... I also thought, I think looking back, maybe I wanted to spread it about a bit as well. You know, I've done it with them. Let's go and do it with them. Maybe yeah. next time I'll go and do it with them. So I went down to see Peter and I did it, did look sharp for him. Uh, I did three tricks for him and two of them I knew he wouldn't go for. I'd save look sharp till last and then he took it. Wow. That's great. P Peter's, Peter's another person that I really owe a lot to as well. Um, Peter's given me so much advice and help and and just you know just been a really great he is a great guy you know there, there, there's two great men in magic people always talk about dave bonsall and how great he is and i have to agree i love dave as well uh, i have a lot of time for dave at blackpool two years ago i took my daughter charlie and she kind of fell in love with dave a little bit um and at dinner one night i said go and do some turn the, she'd learned the Lincoln ring and she could do it and um uh, and she does it like this as well. I've got them here actually. She, she was showing her friend the other day. So she she doesn't do the whole rubbing it together. She can do the um, you know tap tap tap, and then it's linked. And uh, she learned that method. And then she um, yeah she was just great. But she got really embarrassed. So Dave came over to me and he went like bugger off. You go and sit with the, the pop dog guys. And he sat with her for half an hour and gave her a little bit of a magic lesson in the restaurant. And I, when I went back over to her, she was glowing. She was beaming and she was so happy and if I ever lost her in the dealer's hall she'd be a pop dog stand guaranteed so um and, and and Dave's just such a lovely lovely guy but Peter as well Peter's Peter's phenomenal I have utmost respect for him and his whole family I think they're amazing and I just yeah I love them all they're just they're just great you know it, it, it's uh, the, 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 there's so many ways you can go with anything, but I think if you just look for the positive in people and 
you know, that's what Peter does. You know, he's given me a lot of opportunities. He's given me a lot of help. Uh, he's got me doing the Wayne's Wednesday Wizarding Wonder Show. Which I have to a- say, recently, and I know I joked about it at the beginning of the interview that you're the pen fold to his danger mouse, but recently you've become like, almost part of the Alakazam, an unofficial official part of the Alakazam team. Well, he, he phoned me, he phoned me up the other day. All of the live launches, you're on the YouTube channel all the time. He phoned Every- me up the other day and he said, he said, um, do you mind if we put you on the team page on the website? And I was like, oh, uh, and he goes, well, have a think about it. And I had to call him back and go, Peter, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I would love to be on the page. And you just caught me by surprise. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. Such a that's, that's a massive honor to be to be. You know, yes, of course, I would love to be, but don't think I was being ungrateful there because I was just genuinely. I'm very, very, very rarely speechless, but I was genuinely taken aback. And then I said to him, just to, to levity it a little bit, I said, uh, I genuinely thought you were going to offer me ten percent of the company, and he, and he said, nobody wants that debt. <laughs> Thing. Peter trusts your opinion and the reason I know this is because like as you know I'm doing a few things with Alakazam at the moment like several things with Alakazam and whenever I speak to Pete he's like every single time I speak to him he's like I spoke to Wayne about this I've spoke to Wayne about this within 30 seconds of a conversation with Pete your name comes up he's run something by you Now, this is a guy that's been in magic as a dealer his entire life, running it from his garage, his garage. And the fact that he's going to you for your opinion over and over again speaks volumes of what he thinks about you as a person. It's very humbling. I I mentioned to you the other day on the phone tonight, I I, I do struggle with uh, imposter syndrome. Don't worry, I can fix that. You suck. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I need. No, I, I do. I do struggle with that quite a lot, you know. And I've got a new book coming out, and at least three times a day, I think to myself, "What if people look at it and go, this guy has no idea what he's talking about?" You know. And I know they don't because I know I do know what I'm talking about. Can but... I ask you a question? Because yeah, here's the thing: there's a lot of magicians that struggle with imposter syndrome. As somebody who has said to me openly over and over again, "You f- you struggle with it." but also somebody who has got a very successful career despite that. Is there any advice that you can give magicians that struggle with imposter, imposter syndrome? Don't listen. My, my first bit of advice is never listen to everybody's opinion of you. And that includes yourself. You know, you, you know, if, if, if you make sausages, you cook sausages and 99 people tell you that your sausages are amazing. And one person says, I don't like your sausages then that one person, it's their opinion, and they might not like them, but it's not, it doesn't matter because everybody else likes your sausages. So you've made a success of the sausage. And it's like the tricks, you know, if, if anything you do, don't, don't spend too much time in your own head. You know, I, I have a couple of things that I do that really help. So recently, especially during the pandemic, um, I very quickly went through my savings and you know, trying to survive and keep the bills paid, etc. And then I'd be in my overdraft and then I'd get a text message from the bank, you have gone over your overdraft. And then I would sit and panic and not sleep and spend three or four days worrying about it. And then something would happen and I'd get some money and I'd pay it back in and I'd pay a fee, whatever. And I very quickly realised, hang on a minute, all that stress and worrying isn't putting any money into my bank account. It's not helping at all. It's just making me feel ill. So just forget about it. Something will happen. It will sort itself out. Just get on with it. So now when I get the text message saying you're going over your overdraft, yeah, it bothers me, but I don't dwell on it. I don't think about it because I know, okay, I've got this coming up in a couple of days. That will sort it out. There's no point me losing sleep about it. Boom. And it's like that with the imposter syndrome. I think to myself, you know, I look in my diary and I see that I've got three restaurants coming up, including a brand new one called the Waffle and Pancake Shack, which you'll see on my socials, social media stuff. There'll be more stuff being posted about that. I've got my first one coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, if I didn't know what I was doing about restaurant magic, why are these restaurants booking me? If I don't know what I'm talking about with weddings, why have I got so many weddings booked in? You know, I do know what I'm talking about and I have to just, you know, and on top of that, and again, going back to Look Sharp, um, so Look Sharp was released on Thursday and nobody knew, well, only a handful of people knew that it was Look Sharp. 
um, in all the run up to it, there was, he, Peter made a special trailer that didn't say what it was. So no one really knew what it was. Um, so since Thursday, so Thursday, Friday, or Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and today's Monday. So in five days, I must have about 200 messages and emails from people saying how much they love it, even before they've received it. And tonight, I've got a little Zoom group that I'm a member of. Um, three or four of those guys have posted up pictures of their look sharp boxes. You know, oh, I love it. It looks great. You know, actually holding it in my hand now, it looks great. I've been playing with it. And you have to fight off those demons and keep them at bay. And positive thinking is the best way to do that. So I, if, when I do have those moments, and I, I struggle mostly with the imposter. I struggle mostly when people praise me. I'm not very good at accepting praise. And my mate Andy, and I love Andy to bits. He's a great guy. Um, he's really helped me out a lot. Um, he's um, His daughter is my number one fan, mate. She, Molly May May, she calls me Wayney. Uh, in fact, she calls me Wayney. Now the whole family call me Wayney. Uh, even little Stan, her little brother who comes on and I can't wait to meet him next week. I'm gonna get to meet him and give him a big hug. Uh, I love the whole family, they're great. Uh, Lee, the wife, all of them great. But Andy, and I know he's going to watch this, I'm sorry, mate, but I've got to say it. He does praise me a lot, you know, and he kicks my butt about stuff. He goes, that's rubbish, changed out on that video. And I, I listened to him because he's always right. But, um, you know, he does praise me a lot. And I really struggle with that. I really struggle with people going, oh, you're amazing. Oh, you're brilliant. Because I'm just me. And I don't, it's, it, it I know what I do is special to people. People love magic and it makes them feel great. And, and that's, that's brilliant. But it is, at the end of the day, I'm just a normal person. I'm just me. I don't think of myself as being better than other people. I don't see myself as being anything special. I'm just me. You know, I'm no different to the, the, the girl who paints the beautiful picture or the guy who's doing the break dancing. You know, I have a skill and I have a talent, but it doesn't make me better than anybody. And especially with magicians, I get a lot with magicians. They come up to me like, oh, I wish I could do what you could do, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I remember talking to one guy and he was like, he kept praising me as a black boy. He kept praising me and he kept praising me. And like, oh, you're brilliant. Oh, you're my hero and all this kind of stuff. And thank you. It's really flattering, you know, but it's, it's fine. I'm just fine. Let me buy you a drink, right? Because I'm just a normal person. We can have a chat like, that. oh, you're amazing. Oh, I wish I could do. And then he says, can I show you something? I said, yeah, brilliant. And he did the hot shot flip. And I went, God, I wish I could do that. And he went, shut up. I mean, I can't do it. It's one of those things. I just cannot get it. I can do this and I can do that. I can't do that. And, and he was like, I can do something you can't do. And I was like, we all have superpowers, you know? And he was like, he goes, I don't know if I'm happy or sad about that. I mean, we'll be happy because, you know, Batman has a super costume, but he can't fly. We all have our limitations. You know, we're no different than anybody else. You, you, you've got your skills, I've got my skills. I wish I could do something you could do, you know? I think he was a bit guy. I didn't then spend the rest of the evening going, you're amazing, you're my hero. <laughs> <laughs> but it's flattering, it is nice and stuff. But yeah, I do I do struggle with that. I do, you know, it, it's... Uh, I, don't, I don't think I have... I do have an ego. Of course I have an ego. We all have egos. But I don't have the ego that pushes me to, you know... If, if I was on a show, if I was booked on a show and they came to me and said, uh, Wayne, we've, you're not going to headline this show now. We want you to open the second half. I'd have no qualms or problems with that at all. You know, I've, I've got no, yeah, just put me on wherever you want. I'll do whatever you need me to do. And that's how, you know, it's got me this far in life. I think I must be doing something right. No, oh, for sure. Absolutely for sure. Okay. I, I want to... Um... Talking about creativity and bringing out tricks, and obviously you've brought out several tricks now with Alakazam. You've brought out a few, uh, many tricks yourself. But at the time of filming, you're just about to bring out another book. Right? I know my fifteenth book. Fifteenth book. Really? Well, fifth kind of fifteen. I did. I've done six joke books. So I did three comedy edition of joke files, and then I did a compilation of all three, and then I did the joke file because I found that the comedy joke files weren't selling on iBooks and stuff. Whereas, because people saw comedy magician and they just ignored it. So then I brought out three completely different joke books and called them the joke file, one, two, and three. And they've sold amazingly on iBooks and Barnes and Noble and all that. 
and I did a compilation of those as well. So there's eight books there, but really there's just six books and two compilations. And then I did uh, the expert at the restaurant table. Uh, I did the definitive guide. These, these are actually two different books. This, this is an expanded version of this book. Um, I've done a couple of books that aren't, they're magic related, but they're not big releases. There's one on memory, one on, um, on motivation and stuff. Uh, and then I did the, the five big ones are the, the expert at the restaurant table. I did Go Compare, which is a beginner's guide to being a compare teach you everything there's a great chapter in there on stage fright which i thought about putting to every single one of my books uh, it's a really really good chapter to talk about stage fright um then there's um then i did one called plan prepare perform which i renamed parabellum because it was a better name uh power parabellum means if you want peace prepare for war um and that's the heckler book so um it's not a book of put downs and aggressive uh, it's more psychological analysis of why people heckle and the best ways to deal with them without confrontation yeah um there is a section on heckle lines but i think if you want put down to the heckle lines you can just go on google and get them so um you know there's millions on there so parabellum is more about just identifying the heckle or the disruption and dealing with it in the most positive manner that enables you to carry on doing your show um if you have a guy dragged out of the room or he comes up and attacks you you've failed you know, if you can do the, the best heckle line ever, best heckle line ever. I was on stage, all the day, this guy heckled me and I went, what's that, mate? And his response would tell me everything I need to know about him. If he repeats the heckle, I know he's just a, what I call a hit and run heckler. He's, he's someone who just got the opportunity, does it, doesn't understand timing. Now the moment has passed, so his line isn't funny if it ever was. So he repeats it and I just went, thanks for sharing, mate. And then carried on with the show yeah he had his two seconds of moment i've got a bit of a laugh out of it and it's done with if he doesn't repeat the heckle then i know that this is somebody who knows about heckling and knows not to repeat it because now the moment has passed and it could be potentially somebody i'm gonna to have to deal with and then i and, that, and again another analysis when he heckles again so yeah that 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 that's what that book was about and then i wrote maxim's primer um which apart from the next book is probably my favorite one and that's a guide to showmanship <clears throat> and it covers everything you need to do to, to to put showmanship into your act um and it's called maxim's primer which a lot of people have gone oh that's really funny and they don't understand why it's called that um the reason i call it maxim's primer is um if you've seen the film dr strange yeah. when he first meets wong he says how's your sound script and he says uh passable or something like that and he says, well, I suppose you better start off with uh, Maxim's Primer. It will tell you everything you need to know. And I thought, that's the title of the book. So Maxim's Primer, it will teach you everything you need to know. Um, and then now I have, uh, yes, this one, which I have two copies of here, uh, which is my next book, um, which is The Wedding Book. And right. to be honest with you, and this is the restaurant book, and that's the wedding book. And it's almost twice as thick. Um, it, 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 in fact, I think it is twice as thick. I'll have to, I'll have to measure. I'll have to get another copy of it. Um, it's rammed full of information um, from beginners to, you know, from, from somebody who's never done a wedding before. It will take you step by step, hand by hand, all the way through. And for the first time, I'm releasing it also as a hardback as well. And are there tricks in there? That's okay, so what I did was, what I did was, because I've never really done a trick book in one in my, like the restaurant book doesn't talk about tricks. None of them really do. I, I talk about tricks in Maxim's Primer and I describe a couple of tricks and I suppose you could do them from that, but I've never actually done a trick. And then I did Remote Control 1 and 2, which were tricks that could be done on Zoom and over the computer. Um, and it kind of inspired me. So what I've done here is the book... And actually, uh, the contents page is made up of different coloured sections. Uh, the first section, which is grey, uh, it's like a silver, is um, the introduction and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then you get to the pink section, which is getting booked. Uh, so wedding fairs, wedding advertising, websites, wedding suppliers, wedding venues and the booking. Then the yellow section is the wedding, attire, the reception, the wedding breakfast, evening reception, children, the bride and groom. And then the last section, Actually, there are two sections here. The blue section is the magic. And I've put in here 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tricks that I only do at weddings. So um, one of the things that I do at weddings, um, so first of all, one of the tricks in here is the, um, one of the tricks to be fair, is just an advert for the anniversary edition of Look Sharp, because it's ideal for weddings uh, and different from the anniversary waltz, obviously. And I also do a trick with a bottle of wine. Um, now I used to do a thing, a book test, where I would bring out a book and I would say it's good luck to because it's, apparently it's good luck to give a bride and groom a book, any book, for their wedding. So I would have the time traveller, and this isn't in the book. If anyone wants to make this up, this is a freebie for you. So um, I bring out the time traveller, and then I would force a page number on them. And I've done an anniversary waltz with them, blah 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 blah, and then they open up the book and I tell them the, the first word on the page. And then I say, oh, actually, read through the page a little bit. I'm getting a, oh, my God, this is really bizarre. But the page you're, you're on now is actually detailing it's in the Middle Ages and they're at a wedding, like we're at a wedding. And they're reading the story and they're at a wedding. And then uh, 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 oh, the, there's a jester. Would you just read aloud what the jester's just done? And in the book it would say, and the jester, blah, 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 blah and produces a playing card, a, a two-sided playing card, the three of clubs and the four of spades. And that's the card that they've just had on their anniversary waltz. Oh, wow. And then I say, oh, skip over to the next page. What's the name of the bride and the groom? And it's their names in the book as the bride and the groom. That's so the time traveler book is out of copyright. So I took the book, I edited it, changed it, and there is a wedding scene in there, and I just made it fit what I wanted. Then I went to Lulu, I got them printed, and I get one printed every time I've got a wedding. And I just, I, I, what I do is I take out the card that I'm going to use for the anniversary waltz, I, I make a, put in the bride and groom's name, I print one copy, when the book arrives, that card goes into the book, and it's ready to be picked up on the day of the wedding, and I go and do it. However, then I came up with this idea, so this is in the book, um, I do a bottle of wine production, I put it on the table, I do the trick, anniversary waltz, etc. And then at the end, the bottle's been like that on the table. When I turn the bottle round, instead of saying um, Pinot Blanco, it's Mark and Sarah on the label. Underneath that, it's got the date of their wedding. And underneath that, it's got the name of the two cards that they've used for the anniversary waltz. So that's been on the table the whole time after I've produced it at the beginning of the set. And, and then I literally, it's here, I literally spin it round and I just point to it. And this one I had made up to put into the book because I didn't have a wedding book to do one at the time, um, but it normally has a message at the bottom here as well saying, congratulations, love Wayne the Magician. Um, but they people keep that. These labels cost two pounds, 25, three pounds each off eBay. You just tell them what you want printed on it. They print it. It's sticky. So you, you wash the bottle, rub off the label, stick that one on, and it's good to go. I Well, in my car, in the boot of my car, I've got six bottles for the next six weddings I've got already. So on the day, I'll just bring out the appropriate bottle. And, of course, with the Look Sharp Anniversary Edition, it's the same cards, so they've all got the same card on them. So I can do this, then do this. They get a bottle of wine. They're really, really happy, and it's a lovely keepsake for them. That's great thinking. That's great thinking. And nobody's doing it. If you look on, look on, look on these places that do personalised stuff, and look at what they you can have made, and then go right. Well, what can I do with that? Okay. Oh, there's a guy. I've just taken a new trick to Peter that hopefully we're going to release using beer maps. You know, and I found a company that will make beer maps. Oh, you're going to love it. I I had to show it to another time, but you will love it. It's great. Really, really good. <laughs> Um, I'm really proud. I did it the other day. It's close up and cabaret as well. You can do it on stage. I did it on stage. I did it close up yesterday. I did it on stage um, on Saturday. And yeah, yeah fantastic. Right. So yeah. Any anytime people want to be creative, all you've got to do is just, you know, put your mind to it. I, yeah. I, I've always I've, I made a realization recently in the last few years. When I was working on the ships, I was going from ship to ship. I didn't stop. I just went from ship to ship. And then and then I was in Spain and I was just traveling. And when I when I decided to come back to England and stop, it stopped. And then you see people who 
are doing this, and now I'm doing weddings. And I've got wedding, 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 wedding. Because I'm because I'm doing one wedding, I'm doing all the weddings, you know, and it and it goes, and you jump from one to one. So if you're creating stuff, let that flow. Don't let it stop. Again, keep moving forward. So I'm working on something. And, and I will say for anybody out there who might have an idea or who would love to create stuff, is for every good trick I've got, I've got 20 rubbish ones that didn't work. And I've got 20 tricks that came about because another trick didn't work. And I've gone, well, that didn't work. But actually, if I did that with it, that would, that would work. So, you know, if you let it flow and you yeah. don't encumber it and you don't go, well, I'm not going to bother, it's not going to work. If you think that, it won't work. If you think, okay, let's keep rolling with it. And you are heart, heart, uh, disheartened sometimes, but if you keep pushing, you keep going with it, it will flow. And then before you know it, I've now got, I've now got five or six, Peter's got five or six of my tricks looking at at the moment that hopefully will be released, you know? And it's sort of like, you know, you just got to keep, while it's flowing, Keep it how do you decide how do you decide what to do because you're releasing most of your stuff now exclusively either through alakazam or publishing it yourself like the yeah. wedding book is published yourself alakazam uh are obviously brought out the new version of look no sharp and all this other stuff you're talking about how do you decide anybody who's watching this that wants to start marketing their own products as so somebody who's really close with with peter but has also self-published uh, any advice on that as to what um you... one thing about peter that i would say is that a, a he's very trustworthy i'm not saying the other ones aren't but peter's very trustworthy and the the people who are even more prolific than i am if you look at something like jamie Dawes, you know he's constantly putting out new material himself and his stuff is first class. Everything Jamie does is, is brilliant. Um, <laughs> he even came up with a, a scary version. What was the trick we were talking about? And he came up with a scary version for it. And I was like, yeah, you need to get help, buddy. Um, he um, sang to, he sang with clowns and he was like, oh, I've come up with a version. Oh, measure for measure. And he went, oh, you could get a kid up and you got a little girl up on stage and then you could have the it clown come out and drag her off through the curtain. And I'm like, who even thinks like that? <laughs> Um, but but yeah, Jamie's great. But you know, he still releases stuff with Peter. I think this, with Peter, you're getting. I think you said it yourself. Actually, you said you said you spoke to Peter. So I, without naming it, I know what your next release is going to be. Um, I've seen it. I love it. By the way, it's great. Um, and and I think Peter was on the phone with you the other day, and he asked me to go through and do the chapters on the on the, the video for it. It's um, a long project. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, well, I got about halfway through it and he went, oh no, don't worry, I found an easy way then. I was like, yeah, cheers, Pete. Um, but we, um, we what's it called? Um, when you release something with Peter, it's a bit like the Dragon's Den. You're not just getting, you're not just getting someone to market it and make it and finance it and put it out. You're going to get input, improvements, um, and, 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 other people, I'm keep knocking my table, other people getting involved as well. So when Measure for Measure came out, um, I instantly came up with an idea for a children's version for it, uh, a children's routine. And if you buy it, you now get my routine included in the package. Um, he's got another trick coming out um, with, with some cards. And I've come up with an idea for that that I've shared with him. So that, and, and, and I know it's not just me. I know I know Jamie Dawes has got a version as well. And I know so-and-so's got a version. And I know he shows stuff to you as well. So it's because he, he shares with a trusted select few people who he knows. And Peter gave me possibly one of the biggest compliments I've ever, ever had. He said, um, whenever I release or bring out a trick or take a trick to him to release, um, he knows it's going to be a worker. You know, I don't just release a trick just to have my name on something. You know, I don't just go, oh, yeah, um, this is this and it does this because that. And it's not really, you know, I don't make a, all those nonsensical magic tricks. I'm not going to slag any off. But, you know, you, everything I do has a purpose and it's been worked. It's not like, oh, here's a new trick. I just made it up. Hey, can I release it? It's this is something I've taken out and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. And now I'm ready to share it with the magic community. And Jamie Dawes is the same, yours is the same, you know, you, you didn't just come up with gossip and then just put it out. You'd worked it and routined it and, you know, um, finessed it and wrinkled, ironed out the wrinkles and stuff. And then it's ready to be released. And so with Peter, you know that 
one of the reasons that I've launched is so successful is people buy stuff because they know they can trust what they're going to get. And I'm going to, I'm going to say something now that hopefully won't be proven wrong with Luke Sharp. Um, I've always been immensely proud, immensely proud that my stuff very rarely comes up for sale on secondhand magic. People keep my stuff, my books. Um, uh, and if occasionally, very occasionally, I might see a book go up, it's bought almost instantly. You know, if you put something up there, somebody's gone, I'm having that. Luke Sharp was always a big one for that because they couldn't get it mainly. Um, I saw three copies of the restaurant book go on sale. And when I checked the names, it's because they bought the updated version and didn't need the first version, so they sold it. So I'm always really, really proud of that, that, that my stuff doesn't appear on there very much. Yeah. Um, I think that stands testament that, that people like it, refer to it and keep it, you know, and it's, it's a resource that they go to. And again, I get people all the time saying, especially about the restaurant book, they say, oh, oh I refer to it all the time. And, and I released it as a PDF version so that people could have it on their phone. So if they are working and they want to quickly look at something, it's on their phone. They haven't got to take the book with them or everywhere. Um, you know, yeah, it's, 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 that's always been something that's always hit me quite hard that, you know, people do like my stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you've got a great reputation um, for a reason, you know, you've always brought out amazing quality stuff and, you know, look sharp. Uh, he, he, the first time it came out, I saw so many people doing it. It became, for a while, it was like the Omni Deck. You know, it was kind of like people would do Look Sharp before the Omni Deck because it's just such a strong routine. So I remember, I remember being in a restaurant. I think I was in Leicester, and I had a magician. I went in because they'd advertised a magician. I was working, and um, I went in. I said, "What time's the magician on?" They went, "Ah, oh, six to eight. And my wedding finished at half six. I said, can I book a table for half six, please? I'm, I'd really like to see the magician. And uh, I knew that would boost his, you know, boost him up a little bit. Oh, you've got somebody coming in to see you later on. And I sat there and uh, he didn't know who I was. And he came in, and he did some magic for us. And uh, and it was just me, actually, not asked just me, and did some magic for me and stuff. I was like, oh, that's really cool, man. I didn't mention magic at all. Um, I was like, oh, man, I love magic. That's really, really cool. He said, I'm going to show you something that's going to blow your socks off. And then he did look sharp. And I just couldn't tell him. I couldn't. And uh, uh, I left him a £20 tip. And I left him a glowing reference on the website as well, saying, absolutely amazing. Loved it. Brilliant can't fault him keep this man he will he will be an asset for the rest of the career of the, the restaurant and and but yeah i was super super chuffed and i think if i'd have gone oh i'm wayne goodman i'm a magician he might have gone oh i do you look sharp and probably wouldn't have performed it but because he didn't know who i was and because he didn't know i was involved in magic and i was just another punter uh, and he was so excited to get out and do it he was so excited and he did it and he did it good he did it really well and i was so chuffed and so proud for him. And I really genuinely just wanted to stand up and give him a hug and go, you don't know how much that means to me. But I had to hold that back and go, yeah, that's, that's great, man. That's fantastic. And yeah, but really chuffed and really sort of like, and really sold it to me that people do like performing it and people, you know, it is a, it's a trick that people go to time and time again. Before we wrap this up, I want to ask you one more question on the subject of bringing out magic, which is, any advice on creativity? Um, don't be scared. Don't be yeah. Don't be scared of failure. Mm. Um, it's uh, so I'm a bit of a Star Wars fan. I can't deny. It. I've got a lightsaber. I've actually got one of the lightsabers from Attack of the Clones. I think it's in my other room. Um, uh, it doesn't have the saber bit in it. It's just the handle. Um, and a friend of mine who works on films gave it to me for my birthday. I've also got a walking stick from Jurassic Park with the mosquito on the top. Uh, I've got some casino chips from Casino Royale and Ocean 13. I've got a number of, I've actually got the dagger, the dagger from, do you remember the film The Shadow with Alec Baldwin? It was a great film. Yeah. yeah. You know the dagger that comes off from the well, Do you know who created The Shadow? DC, maybe? I don't Dr. know. Dr. B. Gibson, the magician. Oh, wow, I didn't know. Yeah, he created The Shadow. Uh, it was the first comic book hero before Batman, before Superman. The yeah. Shadow was the first one. And he, uh, yeah, created by a magician. I'm a big fan of Walt B. Gibson, so I've got all of his books and big hero of mine. So 
um, yeah, and I've got the, the dagger, it's really heavy. Uh, I'm going to get a thing and it's going to go on the wall up here, I think. Um, but it's, it's Star Wars where my favourite quote comes from, and it's Master Yoda, uh, and he says, um, failure, the greatest teacher is. Meaning, you know, the, you, you can fail so many times, but if you learn from it, you will it will teach you more than anything else. If you go come up with an idea, and it's a great idea, and you just have great ideas all your life, then you're very lucky, and that's brilliant. <clears throat> but all the best ideas come from the fact that I think it was Thomas Edison said. Thomas Edison said, someone said, "How did he invent the light bulb?" And he said, "I created two thousand ways not to make a light bulb." <laughs> you know, I found two thousand ways not to make a light bulb, but I only had to find one way to make the light bulb, and it and it worked. You know, and it's it, it that's it. So don't be disheartened. Embrace failure. You know, if you come up with an idea, I, I, I had a, I've got a trick called whoosh and I might put it out as a download with Alakazam, um, but I'm going to shoot myself in the foot right now. Sorry, Peter. Um, I'm going to shoot myself right in the foot now. The reason I've never released whoosh is because there's a better version of it on the market, a much better version. Um, so the idea is I spread a ribbon, spread a deck of cards, um, a card is selected and taken out signed. I ribbon spread the cards. I take a king and place it face up near the top, about three or four cards down. I take a face, another face up black king, place it three or four cards from the bottom. I square the pack up. I cut the deck, you put the card back in the middle, boom. Instantly I spread the cards out and the two face up cards are jumped to the middle. There's one card between them and it's their signed card. Looks really good, bit gimmicky. Um, but it's a nice little trick if you're doing a competition or a magic club competition or, or you know, a sit down piece apart. It's not really a workable round the table type thing. It's just an idea I had and I played around with it. I was trying to work on a better method for it. And then I worked with Alex Pandrea at a convention and he's got a trick where he ribbon spreads the cards and then he closes the ribbon. And unlike mine, he doesn't turn the deck over. He just moves it across and then ribbon spreads it again and the card is now caught. I looked at it and went, I'm so glad he lectured before I did. <laughs> um, and just a spectacular trick. So I never did anything with it because he'd released a bit. He'd, he'd come up with a similar idea. I had not seen his idea. He came up with a similar idea. It was better, more practical, is workable. And therefore I, 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 I retired mine. Um, but, you know, I, was, I wasn't disheartened. I've come up with about 50 tricks that I've looked through old magic books and found almost exactly the same trick written in the book. And again, instead of being disheartened by it, I thought, well, I'm obviously thinking in the right way. You know, I came up with it independently. Somebody else has already come up with it. I must be thinking in the correct manner to come up with the same principles. And we stand on the shoulder of giants. You know, I don't have to fill the shoes because I stand on my shoulders. And so, you know, yes, I can't do it. It's been done before, but that's a good thing. You know, I've created something that somebody else has created, but the way I'm thinking is obviously the right way to be thinking. Now I've just got to find the thing that somebody hasn't done before and keep working on those tricks. So don't be disheartened. Don't be, uh, don't be put off. Come up with stuff, show your friends, embrace failure and, and always try and find the positive. Great advice. Really good advice. Excellent. I love that I do. I love, I love it. The, the other thing I would say as well, and this is really from the heart, is and I know you're a good guy, and, and I, I hope I'm a good guy too, and Peter's a good guy, and there's lots of good guys out there. And there's also a lot of people who come onto the forums on Discord and all those sort of places who are too scared to come and talk to us because they think that we're these big people. But actually, we are just the same as those. And as much as they might learn from talking to me, I learn from talking to them as well. So don't be ever be scared to, to, to come forward. And there are some amazingly, amazingly talented, we, we're so lucky in magic. I, I, I've got a friend who's a musician and he says that when people come up with new music, it's, it's fiercely guarded and it's, it's until it's public domain, until they release their song, it's fiercely guarded. And magicians are much more sharing. And I know that we have our, our moments and our, our little, public scraps and things but by and large magicians are a lot more caring I, i'm 
I, I know some amazingly creative people, yourself, Peter, Michael Murray, Dave Bonsall, but also lesser known people, people who maybe I should say are up and coming or maybe are already here, but there's like Luke Jonas, who's just released his book, Away With Words. Mm -hmm. This guy, is, Away With Words is great. And I'm very proud that he put a chapter in from one of my books on silence. I did a chapter called The Power of Silence. I use silence quite a lot when I'm working. Um, I actually embrace silence and I, I really like it. Um, so when I'm doing something, I do a thing, I can do it here actually, um, let's move the camera down. I have a card selected and then I say, um, they've got the card and I say, oh, here, I'll write your name on it. And I do that and they look at you and I deliberately hold it until it's awkward. And I'm like, write your name. And, the, and they're going like this with it. They're going like that, what are you doing? No, no, take the pen, write the name. And then eventually, after a few seconds, I go, no, it's a Sharpie. And then, boom, just take the lid off and just write your name with it. And it gets an honest gasp and people like, I know it's a throwaway moment. It gets a real reaction from people. And, um, but I love that moment of awkwardness where I'm pushing it to the absolute limits. That's where my adrenaline is, is pumping because I'm pushing this moment to the absolute limits. And I, I don't want to go, I don't want to go, boom, I'll write your name with it. And they go, oh, you did have a pen which has never happened. I want them to go, where'd that come from? Which is what always happens, you know, because they're not expecting it. Um, and it's such a, and they're confused. They don't know what's going on. What's he want me to do? He hasn't got a pen. You know, it, it, it's that kind of thing. But I look at Luke Jonas and, and he's, his books are filled with great material. He's a great inventor. He's a great performer. He's just really ultra talented, you know, and he's now making, he's just sent me his, um, uh, his book test, uh, the Alice in Wonderland book test. And I read it and I'm like, it's like four book tests in one, three book tests in one. It's just so much you can do. It's so great. Mm. And But if Luke hadn't have taken a step and done those things, we'd never have heard of him. He'd just be another guy who had a good idea. And you can be that guy at home. Right now, I guarantee there's 20, 50, 100 million of you watching this who are going, well, I've got an idea, but I don't know what to do with it. Well, show it to somebody, share it, embrace it, fail with it recreate it rebuild it do it again you might fail 10 times with it but keep doing it keep pushing with it find somebody you can trust share it with them get them to help you with it like i say andy andy uh, chase uh scott payton peter they've all helped me massively with my books and my tricks and other things and 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 it really you know we're all we're all great you know i'm a as magicians we're solo artists we go and we work on our own but really in the background we have a, if you've got a good support network behind you then that moment somebody once told me to do your 10 minutes of glory you've got to do your 50 minutes of crap now that's true but i also think to get your 10 minutes of glory you've got to do your 50 minutes of hard graft yeah so it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing but you've got 50 minutes of hard graft to get you that 10 minutes on stage. Yeah. And by 10 minutes, I'm talking meta, met, metaphorically here, you know, to get your time on stage, you got your booking process, you got your accounts, you got your advertising, your website building, you got your time on the telephone, you got all that stuff that you've got to do that leads to the point where you walk out and go, ta da, and then, you know, boom. But you've got to do that work beforehand. And creating magic and being creative is exactly the same. Work hard keep pushing keep moving forward and you will get there perfect advice absolutely brilliant you are a very knowledgeable guy i would like to say however um that i wayne, suck <laughs> i would like to say that when wayne said that like everybody's approachable and you can go up to him at a convention he's just a normal guy and he said i'm sure you feel the same way i just like to point out that i hate you all i'm better than all of you <laughs> and all of you scum keep away from me i don't want to have anything to do with you anyway moving on with the interview um <laughs> that's what i say to them when they come up to me i, I, I reserved that for <laughs> <laughs> one last question for you wayne i'm okay. going to wrap this up now this has been an amazing interview when we are we are nearing sean farquhar levels of length <laughs> great which is great but one last question which is a question i ask everybody i interview What's next? I mean, we've talked about the first 15 years of your career, globe trotting all over the world, 
literally performing everywhere, seeing the world. Then you come back, you dominate the wedding industry, you dominate the restaurants industry, you dominate the kids' market industry, you create, you've written 15 books, you've published routines, you work with Alakazam whilst having, uh, you know, raising uh, a, a daughter and having, you know, a great home life. I mean, you've literally done it all. You've bought the T-shirt and then you've done it again. Is there anything left? Like, do you have something on your magical bucket list that you have left to achieve? What are your plans, goals, and aspirations moving forward? Do you know, I, I don't really. I never have. Um, I take each day as it comes. There's a there's a, a meme that goes around on Facebook quite a lot uh, of, of a conversation that probably never happened, but it did happen to me. Um, with Again, with my teacher at school, when I was asked what I wanted to be when I left school, I said I wanted to be happy. And the teacher said, no, no, what do you want to do? And I said, something that makes me happy. And they went, Wayne, stop being silly, answer the question, what do you want to be? And I said, I just want to be happy. I don't care what I do. I just want to be happy. And the teacher said to me, well, you don't understand the question. And I said, you don't understand me. <laughs> now on the meme, it says you don't understand life. But I said, well, you don't understand me then, you know, and, and, and that was that. Um, I've never really planned any of it. You know, I didn't plan to, obviously I, I tried to get into restaurants and it worked. I tried to book weddings and it worked. Uh, so there was planning involved, but I never planned to, to do this or release books on it or anything like that. I never planned to, you know, I always enjoyed inventing tricks and then people were saying, you should release that. I would do it in a competition at a club or whatever, and that should be released. You should do that. That's a really good trick. I would pay money for that, that kind of thing. So I, I think my whole life has just been, I have been very, very lucky. And I talk about this, I'm, I am very lucky in as much as I am very, very confident. And I'm very loud and I'm very brash. And when I'm working, I'm a, I'm a monster. But when I'm not working, I am quite a quiet person. And I'm very happy with nothing. I don't like silence. So when I go to bed at night, I put an audio book on and I listen to an audio book in my sleep. And my daughter now does that as well. And she always has really. Uh, when I'm writing the book in the front room, I've got a film on and I'm listening while I'm writing. So I like noise. I think that comes from when I worked on the ships. The cabins were always near the back of the ship, near the engines. So you, you need a bit of noise to drown it out. But I've always been comfortable with noise. Um, but I think, yeah, I've never, I never planned for all that. I think what, what will be next for me? Well, I'll just follow the path. There's a path in front of me. And, and, and I'm walking it. And sometimes the path goes to the left, sometimes the path goes to the right. Um, I would love one day, if you say magical bucket list. Um, I, I always had a, a great idea. If I got enough money and I could afford it, um, I would love to buy a venue. Um, so there's a pub in Newmarket and unfortunately they're ripping it down because uh, it's not sound. But it was a, one of those big town pubs, really, yeah. really big. And it had a second floor, and it had living accommodation at the top. So I'd live in the top, um, and it also had a big car park area that was like overgrown, and also a separate car park. So I thought it'd be quite nice to put a structure on there, maybe build a children's um, activity play center. So out there, the, the pub wouldn't be a pub, there would be a cafe in there, um, and there would be, uh, it would be a venue, a party venue. So you could hire it for parties and functions and events. Uh, so there would be a bar inside, but it wouldn't be a pub pub. And then on the first floor, I would have um, a venue. So you could have comedians, singers, whatever you wanted. Um, I could rent it out during the daytime for people to come in and rehearse. Or I've got a friend who runs a group called Boogie Babes, and she could have it for her, her dancing with the babies, you know, that kind of thing. And then I'd also have my magic show set up there. And then if you booked a magic, if you booked a magic show, you don't have to worry about finding a hall. It would all be included in the price. You come in, you get the magic show in the hall. I don't have to take my, I don't have to drive for hours on end anymore. I can do it all there. Um, and then if you book the birthday party at the hall, then afterwards you get an hour free in the activity play afterwards, you know, as well as people paying to go to the activity play as well. And I'd love something like that. I think that would be really, really cool. I think it'd be really, really good. Uh, you know, you could, you could, if the venue was big enough, maybe, you know, weddings could be held there as well. And again, you book the venue, you get the magician thrown in. 
you know, right. you're going to be there. Um, it's my venue. You know, I go and do a bit of magic around the tables. And again, it's my venue. I can have it set up with whatever I want in there. I just think it'd be really nice to have something like that. So maybe that'd be my ultimate goal. To, to I'd get... buy a ticket. I'd buy a ticket to that. Yeah, I think, I think I think it'd be really cool. You know, come in. My magic show set up behind a, a... I'd have a thing that would drop down so nobody can go behind there. When it's time for the show, press the button, it lifts it up. There's the whole stage set up for me. But then when I'm not in use... The, the wall comes down nobody can get that'd be a magic wall it would be great you just press a button the wall would move all the kids would go oh, you know there's a magic show there you could you could have any effect in there that you wanted i think it'd be amazing so yeah that's 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 something i think about a lot you know when i'm daydreaming and stuff but the rest of it i just go with the flow and i and i trust i i trust myself i think that's the most important thing actually you have yeah. to trust yourself you have to go you're going to go down this route You've got to trust yourself that A, if it's the wrong route, you're going to spot it and not be scared to come back. But also, you know, you're going to hit a point where you're going to want to turn back and you've got to keep pushing forward. Yeah. And it's those, that's those moments. And, and the best advice I was ever told was if it was really that easy, everybody would be doing it. Very true. If you want to do it, you know, you've got to earn it. And what an amazing way to end this interview. Wayne, this has been absolutely fantastic. Well, thank you very much. I've, been, I've had a blast. It's been really great. And yeah, I'm really honoured to be asked to be on here. You've been awesome. You can get all of Wayne's tricks by uh, contacting directly. I'm going to put the URL to his website down below. Also, your social media. Can people follow you on Instagram? Yeah, uh, well, I'm on, I'm on. I have to thank Diamond Jim Tyler for this, actually. I worked with him a few years ago at Smoke and Mirrors. And he had a great joke and asked me if I, his joke was .com and asked him if I could have the .co.uk version. He said, yes. Um, so I always say to people, you can find me on YouTube, Google, Twitter and Facebook, or you can just type in you Googling twitface.co.uk and that will take you to my website. <laughs> it's a great gag. I love it. Whenever I do that on stage at the holiday parks, um, at, at that moment, I will notice little pockets of light opening up around the room as people go and see. If, and then you hear people going, it works. It actually works. It's his website. So, yeah, you're Googling twitface.co.uk. But, yeah, I'm on Facebook. I'm on, uh, I use Facebook mainly. Um, and I'm on the Discord for Alakazam as well. Um, and I would say if you've, got, if you've got an idea and you would like some advice, uh, you know, I've had a few people come to me and say, would you watch my trick? And then is it good enough to take to Peter? I happily look at anything you want and anything you show me will be done in strictly it's strictest confidence. Um, and um, yeah, you know, it's all about helping each other. You know, it's okay to be pulled up every now and again, but you've got to remember you've got to pull somebody up as well. And it's, it's a two way street. So yeah, contact me, say hello. I'd love to chat as okay. you can tell. <laughs> Absolutely. Guys, make sure you leave a comment down below for Wayne because I know he'll see it. Support him, buy his books, buy his products. Check him out on the uh, the Alakazam YouTube channel as well with Wayne's Visiting Wednesdays. And like he said, he's also spearheading the Alakazam um, uh, Discord channel, which is absolutely amazing. I've talked about this on the, uh, on the channel before. But one more time, Wayne, this was absolutely incredible. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, buddy. Guys, make sure that, uh, like I say, you leave a comment down below for Wayne. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. We put in 26 videos up a week now. So you're going to be back again tomorrow. We've got four videos going up tomorrow. One at two, one at six, one at eight, one at nine. So I'll see you then. Thanks very much for watching. My name's Craig from Magic TV. Magic TV.